Oh man, I've I've watched this damn film so many times this month. It's, <laughs> it's oh, really, it's, yeah. It's it's one of those films that I I I can watch any time. I'll be honest. It's one of my go to films. You know how you guys were talking about um, uh, Prince of Darkness mm. as one of those films that you could watch any time. It's just one of those films. This is the same for me. Wow, I love it. I, 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 I haven't seen this in a, I, I can't pin the exact I mean it's, no, it's not a Candyman situation but I, <laughs> I have I have seen it before but I think I've only ever seen it once or twice before and I I enjoyed it both times uh-huh. but it's just one that um, has slipped from my mind uh, over, over the years it kind of went away for a long time it, mm. it wasn't very that well received when it first came out it wasn't even that pervasive a lot of people don't know about it you know um it wasn't critically well received didn't make an enormous amount of money and then kind of dissolved but it has had it's one of those films once again that's had a bit of a renaissance in recent decades you know with the internet and word of mouth and whatnot and now of course it's it's accounted as part of uh, carpenter's apocalypse trilogy yeah I mean, I yeah. certainly would have been yeah. a carpenter completist about it because, I mean, even films that dip into un- other genres for him, I, I, I think I've, I've, I've seen everything and, oh, and I, probably I, got I, everything, you know, right fan. back to the, yeah. you know, Precinct 13 days even and all that stuff. Even stuff that isn't as successful is at least interesting. There's mm. always heart, there's always enthusiasm, and there's always sincerity behind it. I mean, but, uh, there's quite a few of Carpenter's films that are go-to films for me, actually. The Thing, watch it anytime. It's so good. Um, yeah. oh, Big Trouble in Little China. <laughs> it's just so good. <laughs> yeah. It's it's one of the, one of the most bizarrely positive films in terms of the way it treats its audience <laughs> i have ever come across it like it's like a hug the film is like a conspiratorial hug it draws you in and it's like <laughs> we're gonna have a laugh D- yeah. don't just just put aside any preconceptions you have about what kind of film you think this is don't worry about it we'll get where we're going it's going to be a <laughs> laugh getting there and i just i adore that i adore that quality now that was a strangely successful film. I remember that one being <clears throat> very well known and you know very well, well received. And, yeah, absolutely. Particularly absolutely. among my cousin's generation because he's he's ten years older than me. I've mentioned mm-hmm. it before, um, and uh, it was really popular with him and his friends. I remember when it was. Uh, I was a wee bairn, but uh, I, I do remember the, the sort of buzz around it. For him. I just love trying to describe it to people Guys. who've never seen it before. <laughs> uh, what do you say exactly? Oh. It's a sort of buddy martial arts gangster Americana romance ghost monster horror story. I'll it's- do it. <laughs> yeah it's all things to all men and women it's just fantastic it's like it's like carpenter went what do i enjoy what are my influences i'll just throw them all together in a blender oh. and just let them go funnily enough jack and i were talking about that briefly today about uh oh wear your influences on your sleeve it's so much fun mm. and you know that's that's the yes. way things get constructed and absolutely and and, and, and uh, passed on it's like it's almost like oral tradition storytelling yeah. you know, don't be ashamed of them i mean no. you know, it's, it's, there's this whole thing happening at the moment in horror communities actually in writing circles in generally about fan fiction mm-hmm. you know and some of the most successful works of the last decade have started they've had their roots in fan fiction mm. you know it, it's where people begin it's where people start it's fine I mean, yeah i mean it doesn't even have to go that far i mean i i, I just meant in the sense of um uh, not being coy about influences because the once you have say a smorgasbord of, of, of influences they will probably be fairly disparate anyway mm-hmm. when you put them all together you create a new piece of information yeah. and i think people I, i've sort of had this uh, over the last week or so with um with with the acting job with the day job mm-hmm. because for a long time i, I was I, I was just very at ease with well you know uh, I, there's only going to be a few hundred people who will see me in toto so it doesn't matter if i'm stealing all over the place from mm-hmm. previous iterations of sherlock holmes who were seen by far more people <laughs> millions of people and are you know iconic uh, because uh, they're bloody good at it and, yeah. but what's interesting that's happened now is i think i've imbibed so much of their little things whether it's a, a Cushing thing or a Ian Richardson thing or a Douglas Wilmer thing or a Jeremy Brett thing and of course I'm not comparing myself to any of these great actors <laughs> but it does mean now in the last week it's all just sort of settled and they're yeah. in there and I do feel quite confident that a new piece of information has been created out of 
that combination plus whatever it is that I readily bring because now we're in that lovely almost automatic phase of it's just happening yeah, and, yeah, yeah. and it's not stopping me or distracting me or uh, it's and some of the um, more obvious uh, signifiers have just been smoothed out and it's uh, and that's what happens I think with people who write or mm-hmm. make music and they are <coughs> Um, they're they're okay about saying to the world these are my people these are who I like oh. this is the work I enjoy and well, that moment of, it of is, recognition is wonderful for us as an audience absolutely yeah it's part of part of the process is communicating what you enjoy isn't it what inspires you mm. that's the, it's almost like it's the anatomy in, of imagination absolutely all fiction begins as fan fiction doesn't it yeah um, it absolutely does shakespeare Even when you don't starts intend out it. writing <laughs> thomas kidd and christopher marlowe fan fiction you know it's yeah it, it's just what you do every writer starts by imitating the, the writers that they love that they mm. that they want to uh, that they want to be like absolutely uh, and it's, I mean, it's very interesting that we should get immediately onto this because uh, <laughs> the, the text is a tissue of quotations and yeah uh, well, and this one in particular in right the mouth of in, madness. in yeah. the mouth of in madness, the mouth of I madness mean, it's about this it's it's about that very phenomena <laughs> it, it is that phenomena made manifest on the screen isn't it in a story um yes. the meta quality of this i mean it's very 1990s for one thing in the same way that prince of darkness was is like raw 1980s in, encapsulated in celluloid in film this is the 90s this yeah, is what's interesting about 90s i horror. think in a funny way mouth of madness is kind of it's not just very 90s it's very specifically 1994 in yeah. exactly the same way that Prince of Darkness isn't just very 80s, it's very specifically 1987. You know, right. just, <laughs> these are these are films that are extremely of their moment in a in a in a in a funny way. Carpenter has that knack of just being completely hooked in. Well, I think that's part like of textual it. Textual diaries, aren't they? <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, and it, it, it's it's Carpenter almost demonstrating. It's not conscious. He's not doing it as a sort of display, but he's demonstrating like his chameleonic nature. The fact that he can actually adapt to differing trends in cinema, and this is this is very much. It may as well have been Prince of Darkness, nineteen nineties. And it's very funny because when I was watching it again, it's been a long time since I've, uh, I've seen this film and I was having a right giggle um, mm. as it was, uh, we were about halfway through watching it. I watched it with my partner and uh, I, I said, because the, one of my great loves of Carpenter is this, what we were just talking about, this wearing on the sleeve and being so uh, uh, gleeful about his schlocky influences yeah. as well, because I'm, I was watching it and say, and I, I turned to my partner at one point, I said, you know, this is like an exuberant B movie variant of another film that I love hugely, um, but it's in a very different mode, a very different vibe, and it has different aspirations. And it's um, the Coen brothers, a serious man. Uh, Because it's all about text shaping reality, how ideas mingle with the material, how ideas are reified, text Mm -hmm. shape reality. And I mean, the monotheisms have this down. And obviously this one goes into Christianity and obviously a serious Mm -hmm. man, it goes into Judaism. But it was like, wow, this is like the B-movie schlocky, a serious man. (laughs) I love the fact that the film is is, is conscious of that quality as well. I mean, with Entrench, you've got someone who embodies like the cynicism towards this kind of fiction, the stuff that... Carpenter absolutely loves and is putting on the screen here all the way through the film Trent describes horror fiction in in the most deleterious terms he just he, he finds it brainless he finds it you know rote and schlocky he can't stand it and then of course the ultimate irony he finds out that he's what he calls reality he's living it he is part of it he's actually a character in one of these stories and always has been he is a stock character. Yeah, there's there's yeah. a reason that he's he's like he. I mean, Sam Neill um, obviously realizes what's going on, and he plays it this uh-huh. way. He plays it very 1940s detective or 90. 19- well, like, he he's very very reminiscent of um, uh, Walter Neff in Double mm-hmm. Indemnity. Uh, <laughs> yes, not, not, I mean the, the character is written that way, and Sam yeah, Neill plays yeah, it that yeah. way. He plays that's it like, like he's in a 40s movie, like an uh, movie. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Trent is. Um, it reminds me of that joke. Um, 
I'm very skeptical about astrology. Cancerians are like that. Because <laughs> that's, um, that's what Trent's doing in this film. Trent is, is uh, the guy who is incredibly cynical and disdainful of horror fiction, mm -hmm. precisely because he is a horror fiction stock character. Absolutely. And he's <laughs> designed like, to be that way. Wonderful you know, moment, isn't it? When uh, his car can't escape the narrative. I mean, he oh, is turned yes. into a determined character. <laughs> The way he responds to his circumstances and the way Sam Neill plays it is wonderful. And that it is such a funny scene because it absolutely it? obeys the rule of comedy as well. It's, if your audience has laughed once, do it again. If yeah. they laugh twice, do it a third time. And I think it's five or six times. Yeah. They, they pull that. And it is so, and it just becomes increasingly hysterically yeah. funny. And it's edited in a really funny way as well. Like at the big, in the first one, it's really protracted and you don't know what's going on in the same way that Trent doesn't. <laughs> know what's going on and it's quite frightening and like you don't reality is being edited like like a film or like a text on a page the the last one it just cuts and you immediately see him running into the crowd and it's yeah. like oh right okay <laughs> all right this is the way it's going to be is it and his reactions are just wonderful <laughs> they're yeah. so beautifully overdone <laughs> i mean neil's great it's also this. It's, it's mirrored later on when you get the scene at the very end when Trent is in the cinema watching himself on the screen uh -huh. yeah. and you get the, the bit where he says, this is not reality, not reality, yeah. not reality. No. And uh, those are obviously alternate takes of the same scene because they're uh -huh. slightly different. So what I used to love happening? is, uh, what I love about this is that it used to be almost the province of films like uh, Man with a Movie Camera or Eight and a Half, Fellini's Eight and a Half, and it would be very serious and, 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 uh -huh. and lean into the avant-garde. And now by 1994, Carpenter's like, no, I've got this now. And it's mm -hmm. just incredibly funny. I mean, yeah. It is underpinned by big ideas, you know, these mm -hmm. ideas that Fellini had played with in the 60s and so on. But seeing them transposed into this schlocky 1994 <laughs> environment it's just well, so enticing it's great isn't it i mean we've, we've already talked a little bit about other films that this resembles in the in the back channel we talked a little bit about how this is like um we firstly we said it's like the comedy version of prince of darkness mm -hmm. uh, because this film is not just full of quotes it's full of self quotes which is yep. something we can talk about but it's all we also said it's um it's like a a schlock comedy version of cronenberg's naked lunch <laughs> and Na Naked Lunch is, of course, a very free adaptation of that novel, which is it has its own concerns as well. And it's it's at least as much about the process of um, of texts th through various forms. Um, and uh, and so is this. And I think I think you're absolutely right. It's doing a lot of that stuff that was done in early cinema as a sort of th I mean, um, man with a movie camera. That's like it's that's part of that. Um, strain of early cinema where they're trying to and kind of all early cinema is doing this to some extent or another where they're trying to work out exactly what they have here what is this yes. medium how does it work what does it mean yeah what is the and reality so, of this medium yeah how do, how yes. are characters yeah. supposed to respond to the medium that is from the rules that, of their world but that is from that moment and in in a way there's there's a there's a, there's a case for saying that we we have kind of thrashed that stuff out you know that and uh, John Carpenter's sort of picking it up in form, and he's mm -hmm. actually using it to 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 talk about more than yes. just yeah. you know what yeah. how cinema works. It's not just a send up; he does add information yeah. to it, definitely. Oh yeah, uh, yeah. I think the other and, and I think Cronen that great lack of pretension that, that you were talking <laughs> about is precisely how he can get away with this. It's, it's a so kind of charming. A, um, only Nixon could go to China situation. You know, <laughs> only Carpenter, who is so resolutely pulp and schlock and unpretentious, could could do something this self-referential and yeah. metatextual and avant-garde and alienating to the audience yeah. and sort of sell it to a big studio and sell it to audiences. I mean, as you say, it didn't it wasn't a massive hit, but it was released in, in the mainstream as a big release. Um, only he could get away with this because of that resolute um, position that, that he's occupied. Definitely. And I, I think you, you mentioned one thing there, which obviously shoots off rhizomatically like so much of this film. And that was Cronenberg and Naked Lunch, mm -hmm. because I thought I thought there was a lot of Videodrome as well. I mean, certainly the idea of the signal uh, being uh, you know on the threshold of people's perception of reality and fantasy here, it's text. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, uh, one of the things that really impacted on me 
as the film was cl- coming to a close was a th- was you know carpenter didn't have a great commercial success with this movie he could almost do it again and make it about social media as the keystone i was thinking of it exactly that early rather before than it came um, on. if they ever like remade the this film or did a sequel absolutely it would be a, a web or series or an arg or something, or like, something that. Yeah. like that yeah but it's but it, that is, crum- it is kind of a it's kind of a scarily prescient film because as you as you say it's made before social media happened really but the internet was just starting in in people's lives and uh, so many of the of the social phenomena that have come with all that uh, seem to be prefigured in this absolutely yeah yeah. i mean even uh, like the future of horror itself uh, in terms of where it would go on the internet i mean when you look at stuff like the slender man mythos all of the the Mm -hmm. the arg phenomena the um what is it we've got at the moment it's the um the analog horror craze that we're getting online at the moment all of those themes all of even the imagery is encapsulated in this film Mm. yeah there's horror now in the in the information age that we live in is to a huge extent it's it's two things it's viral Mm -hmm. and it's about it's about media text it's about the media itself right yeah yeah absolutely the the hauntology of vhs you know the hauntology Mm -hmm. of tracking lines and uh, vhs Mm -hmm. footage and the the virality of that sort of and and um the the evil and the horror and the apocalypse lurking inside the transmissible and shareable and thus virally proliferating um media artifact it's, well, that's exactly it's, it's how this is described right and exactly. what i love is the way yeah. it's communicated as well you get all of these little it's very night of the living dead that's another thing it references right the yes, way it's... it tells its back mythology you get all of these yeah. little snippets of conversation on radios and on televisions and whatnot about the the wider effect of this apparent virus that's being spread perhaps by sutter kane's books and that's how it's communicated and that's how that, those are the terms that are used it is a it is a viral form Form of madness which also leads us again back to cronenberg with naked lunch i mean mm-hmm. who was it who famously said language is a virus william s burroughs yeah. and th- yeah. this film i think you know is, is also very strongly it seemed to me about the art or craft if you prefer of adapting novels for screen uh, mm-hmm. which of course cronenberg yes. had had to, had, had to do his way with naked lunch so how you use the words to generate images i love how trent even cuts up the covers oh, of the novels yeah. the, the image form is more important at the start it has to be made visual cinematic mm-hmm. and, but it also reminded me of the um of the recreation of media in a wider sense you know the because you, you start the movie with those huge printing presses at the beginning as i say trent cutting up the covers of Kane's book to find new information. I mean, that's pure yeah. William Burroughs, or rather, <laughs> probably more so, actually, the popular image would be less William Burroughs, but to a, a 90s audience, it would probably be the image of David Bowie on the Cracked Actor film by Alan Yentob, who was mm-hmm. who is shown literally gutting his diaries and notebooks and magazines and reassembling them on camera to churn out lyrics. Uh, for the diamond dogs album and and carpenters oh. translating text fiction onto film uses now this is where i thought the film was really interesting because it seemed to me that carpenter was almost trying to make this or take this angle that in order to translate text fiction onto film it uses everything but content it uses location it uses mm-hmm. maps cover art pure imagery more than text and subtext because i think with him with carpenter I think he's also batting around the idea of where text and moving image fiction fail to merge or where Mm -hmm. they don't overlap successfully. And it's in that gap, of course, brilliantly and literally in the film's plot where the horror emerges. <laughs> yeah, it's quite brilliant. I mean, one of the things he also relies on, of course, is the or- just just ambient knowledge of the audience, the things they will know about horror cinema and about yeah. horror literature and about those cultures. I mean, there are constant references here, obviously, to Stephen King, who at this point yeah. was still riding high. You know, Stephen King was yeah, just... Well, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Stephen King was this was this is sort of this is pre JK Rowling, isn't it? You know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the the names that would come to eclipse King in literature as the as the popular author de jour hadn't happened yet. Yeah. It's so fascinating to remember back to being a child and mm. having those trips to the supermarket with mum, you know, just to get the week's groceries, and you'd pass by the magazine rack and into the book rack. And the only names that yeah. i can remember 
was Stephen King, yeah. James Herbert, and Virginia Andrews. They yeah. they filled. Yeah. They just filled. It shelf so... after shelf after shelf, and of course, as a kid, you're immediately drawn to the Herbert and King of stuff course. because of the covers, well, the, the covers, pulp fiction, right. co- which yeah. this film obviously riffs on. Those. Oh, wonderful by the way, those covers are covers. wonderful. They're fantastic. They are Great, wonderful. They, they yeah. are so redolent of the things I would have seen on my my mother's bookshelf. You know, it's so redolent. Yeah. and everyone and, a parody of a Lovecraft title, which yes. I just love. I think that's so funny. <laughs> you can <laughs> literally pick out the titles. <laughs> 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 yeah it's brilliant honestly yeah, and the fact the that it's aware it is aware from hell thing. Yeah, yeah it is aware of that history it's aware of that culture and it doesn't i love the way the film doesn't really make a muchness of it it doesn't like you know it doesn't actually tell the audience that this is what it's doing it just allows you to understand that that's what it's doing through its visuals yeah, and it's a moment as in you time, were saying, let's go. it relies upon contextual knowledge on the part of the audience which is why it takes some disorienting um narrative leaps because it just doesn't bother filling in the stuff that everybody watching it who's familiar with the horror genre knows goes there you know it just skips over it and of course by doing so it emphasizes it yeah yeah and and uh, just one more on, on, uh, point on those books it's a it's a moment in time that's gone uh, uh, book sleeves yes. don't look like that anymore they're yeah. so tepid and, and, and it's true. down and dull oh, and boring oh. and yeah oh god aren't they yeah if you compare like the the cla- you know c- compare the reprints of stephen king novels mm-hmm. with their abstract you know two or three colors very very stylized abstract and very respectable yeah. um covers yeah. and you compare them to the original covers from the 70s and 80s and stuff like that it's there's no yeah. comparison and, just, it's, and geez it's it didn't even have it's to be sad. um things like stephen king novels or james herbert novels. i can remember uh, as a kid my grandmother's collection of agatha christie and those covers were terrible oh, those yeah like, they're amazing like, those massive surreal covers. of eyes or giant you know a wasp attacking a plane or something uh-huh. just you know what the hell yes. and, and of course she was so i, I mean I, I think i was even pre able to read a bit you know but you were just so fascinated by those covers and they were they were terrifying and alluring all at once yeah the first bite is with the eye right Mm. absolutely yeah but it's a it's a marker of a of a um a model of publishing that doesn't exist yeah. anymore. Pulp pub, publishing really doesn't exist anymore. No, it would be considered disrespectful in a way, in a bizarre kind of way, wouldn't it? You know, as though yeah, you're somehow insulting the stature of these authors. Not, you know, not understanding that a they began in pulp and they they still largely still write pulp. You know, <laughs> and, and sadly, yeah, this that... film, which is quite, which is not quite, it is very arch, but it still takes on a different arch form than if it was done there. It would have an extra layer of, well, announcing itself. It would. Oh, if it was done now, you would have characters standing around talking a lot. Because there really is no uh, gap anymore where where basically the high-end B-movie can happen. What is the high-end B-movie? Where mm-hmm. are they? They're not about anymore, are they? That yeah. is a thing that sort of ended in this era. Where yeah, you get a, a cheap film. You know, it's a cheap film that's is a cheap competently film. made, but it it is it's a b movie yeah but <laughs> yeah, it's a high end b movie high end b movie yeah and it's beautiful i mean it's absolutely beautiful right. i mean you know look at the the monsters look at the actual oh, old God. ones in this and the yeah. way they're framed i mean carpenter knows what he's doing with this stuff he knows how to shoot this stuff they are essentially big rubber monsters aren't they yeah. and yet they are so fleshy and tangible and varied in their anatomy and as a result and the way he shoots them so disturbing Mm. so upsetting i i just love the sequences where you see them you just glimpse them yeah 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 and it's it it reminded me actually that the the chase sequence where he Ah, he's trying to get back and all i could think of was hellbound with yes. with a similar situation where you get a big fleshy Barcarian uh, gestalt or whatever it is chasing down uh, the main character in that, and it, that, that they're, they're the parallel images. The, the original, there's a sequence in the original Hellraiser. The original, it's right, the original the Hellraiser actually, yeah. not not Hellraiser. It is. Does it happen in Hellbound as well? Is, yeah. Kirsty is chased down a corridor by the the That's creature, right. the the fourth Cenobite that is yes. known as the Engineer, I believe, yes. extra extra texturally. 
That's yeah. right. It's the very reminiscent of that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and yet, even on the the non prosthetic level, on the the non monster, level, there are images in this where you're like, oh my god! I think the image of the 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 uh, the, the hotelier who's chained to his wife's ankle oh, yeah. is just really like, distressing. God. Right? Yeah, it's and I love very that that's, disturbing. Uh, that's uh, I, I don't I have forgotten the actress's name, but I know she's Mrs. Chalfont and 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 she's one of David Lynch's alumnus alumni. Mm-hmm. Uh, she's Mrs. Chalfont who um, I mean it's again it's a lovely little parallel because Mrs. Chalfont in the Twin Peaks universe is from the Black Lodge. It's her of and her course. son, um, and uh, here she is running a hotel in yes, Miss Pickman, and you know, of course, you know another style. Lovecraft reference. Yeah. Yes, yes, of course, yeah. Which was, is just was glorious. Twin Peaks. Was Twin Peaks a thing by the time this was made? Oh, Twin Peaks so. was, yeah. Twin Peaks was, was um, yeah. had, had basically been and gone. I was going to say um, it was gone, wasn't it? Uh, and, and also at Fire Walk with me because that was ninety two. That but was ninety two, inter- yeah. It, it is mm. interesting that you say this because th- I mean, I, there is well, something very re- Lynch in here, then, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, in here anyway, because I mean, this is a movie that makes, to, to my mind, ex- explicit stuff that David Lynch had in Twin Peaks and other films had made implicit i mean Mm -hmm. twin peaks itself and the hollywood of mulholland drive or inland empire you know is hobbs end it is a place on another plane of reality and i love this idea that carpenter just uh takes to the extreme something that lynch drops in because lynch's big thing with twin peaks is we live in a dream but who dreams the dream i mean that's that and that's something that lynch keeps returning to in the return uh twin peaks the return um, and, and Lynch, of course, is always, has always said that his goal has been to capture dream on film. That's what he mm-hmm. thinks film is, uh, you know, and, all, and, and he does it in that kind of puzzling, slippery form that Carpenter uh, does as plot in this film. So here yeah. it's Cain and the Book of the Old Gods that we see. And of course, in David Lynch, it's all under a, a rather opaque veil. You can, yeah. you can ask yourself, well, who is the dreamer? Is it Laura Palmer? Is it Dale Cooper? Is it the fireman? Is it Sarah Palmer? As the the return seems to lean heavily mm-hmm. into, and of course the mystery in Twin Peaks is how the dreamer's identity remains lost, and in the Mouth of Madness we have a clear antagonist. Mm. We almost have fucking Moriarty. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, I mean, like, but I love it because it's like yet yeah, because Lynch's Lynch's currency is ambiguity, and it works uh, so well for him because he knows how to handle it. And Carpenter's currency is absolutely upfront and giving you yep. everything, and he makes it work for him. And he really does, doesn't he? It just goes for the gusto, this film. I mean, Jürgen Prock now is amazing <laughs> as Sutter Kane. He's having a lot of fun. And in fact, that's something that, that characterizes this whole film. Everyone seems to be in on the joke. Yeah. And that really works for it. It really works. It the, could mean, have pulled it apart, but I think yes, they're intelligent enough to play it. It could. I mean, we've we've spoken Correctly. before, haven't we, about the, uh, the, the, the overuse, the overlayering of irony and how that can absolutely smother a film here it's just enough it is just enough it could have tipped over very very easily but it works i can't very believe glib. how intelligent sam neill's performance is once i got past because i haven't for whatever reason i haven't seen a film with sam neill in for quite some time uh-huh. so for, for the first 20 minutes of the film i was distracted by the realization he does sound exactly like pierce brosnan uh-huh. um, and <laughs> once i got over that because i just kept closing my eyes going oh my god this is so weird i just keep seeing. um but is the it's how he pushes it how he modulates it how he riffs on being uh, one moment every man bewildered uh, protagonist and then the next as Jack I think absolutely rightly hits the the 40s film noir mm-hmm. um, you know archetype and how he shuffles between them and uh, and and it's so good I just kept thinking he had to keep notes on his script he must have kept yeah. note of his shooting days and know when to turn it up I bet it was in the margin somewhere this is when I turn these scenes I turn it up these scenes I bring it down this uh, you know it's it's very well modulated it's really interesting because the casting of Sam Neill, I think, helps the character enormously. I get the impression, maybe completely wrong, but I get the impression that Trent on the page was much more bare bones. It feels like he was a, just a bit of a nihilistic bastard on the page. And why did he do it? I mean, he was 
this is post Jurassic Park. He was yeah. hot property. He could have taken anything. He was but doing it, a lot back of to our, Yeah, it's back to our Candyman era. thing about you know people who who gain a profile who are you know are, are, are recognised for being good craftspeople or good artists, and they make these choices. He did a quite a bit of horror around this era, and a lot of horror that was not well received. So he did Event Horizon as well. Of course, yeah, yeah. Which is another film that was terribly received, which actually I kind of like, I'll be honest. Saw it in the cinema, never seen it since. Yeah, yeah, me too, me too. I it is watch like it this again. film, it is flawed, but I just, I just love its intensity. One of the things I do remember, and I say I saw Event Horizon in the cinema at the time, I have never seen it since. It's but one of the things film. I remember really loving was even at that age you know the the, uh, the, the curtains in the cinema go back and uh-huh. up comes the you know the, uh, uh, the, the, the the opening shot and I think oh god you brace yourself for something that was brilliant when it was originally done because it was originally mm-hmm. done by Ridley Scott which is that right. slow disquieting ambient space shot with uh, uh, moody synths just layering in no the fucking prodigy starts it off <laughs> and it was I remember being in the cinema going this is brilliant we're getting a full on kind of big beat dance track as the yeah. opening to a science fiction movie when every science fiction movie since 1979 is going no well, we better do what alien did it's like <laughs> no alien did that and alien yeah. was right to do that every, the rest of you get lost and then this just was like oh my god it's the funky shit and it literally is that <laughs> <laughs> i love it because there's a sort of there's a sort of earnestness to it. i mean this film does the same thing doesn't it with its faux metallica right oh yeah and, so like, funny <laughs> But couldn't get them. So John Carpenter, being John Carpenter, is like, oh, we'll just do it ourselves. Yeah. I'll just write oh. my own rip off of Enter Sandman and that'll, <laughs> yeah. that'll be fine. Yeah. <laughs> it so works. No, you have to give it to you have to give it to Event Horizon because it's very visibly doing um Alien crossed with the Shining. That's yeah. that's very yeah. visibly it's what it is true. doing. With a bit of but help not, for good measure. With with a bit of Hellraiser, indeed, yeah, but it's not genuflecting before any of them. Um, no. I think that's no. kind of. I have a, I have a serious soft spot for a lot of Paul W S Anderson stuff. I like <laughs> the original Resident Evil movie, for instance. Mm. Yeah. Um, as 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 kind of crap as they are, I like them, <laughs> and I think there's a, there's an extent to which he's so sort of he's so in love with pulp pulp mm-hmm. cinema. Fantastic, Mr. So, Fox. It's a great film. Yeah, it's a yeah. great it, film. <laughs> he's got a kind of he, he's got a kind of um hammer-headed sensibility you know where he he obviously loves it all but he doesn't have enough respect for it to become timorous yeah yeah, yeah. So, yeah. 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 Uh, timorous is not a word you could ever describe event horizon it, 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 it's yeah. it's there are there are images in that film that really upset me mm. some of the production design is amazing yeah it that really the, is beautiful yeah the hyperdrive chamber thing with this oh, sort of great oh. swirling which is I've got to go back to this film. I've got to go back. It's effectively a lament it. configuration, isn't it? Let's be honest. It's a big science yeah. fiction lament configuration. It's Leviathan. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's like um, it's like um, the 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 Star Trek um, engineering section crossed with the 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 Hellraiser box crossed with the cockpit from Alien. Yeah, it's um, true. Sure. How can you not like this? You yeah, know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's those shots of the hell dimension that are just almost subliminal. Some of the imagery in that is horrific. It's brilliant. The, it's brilliant. The, the airlock scene. God. The airlock scene is proper. Disturbing. Please no. I mean, no, I can't. Yeah. I can't. No, can't deal with that. I can't <laughs> deal. This is, there are certain things I really, really dislike, and anything like that that's to do with air pressure and things bursting or compressing. Don't like that. And I don't like another thing that's in this film is that anything to do with like slitting of the wrists or any, that really. I don't know, freaks. I hate it. I hate its guts, and th- that all of that is in this film. It does <laughs> eyes as well, doesn't it? Torn yeah. out eyeballs. Don't yeah. like it. It's great. It's brilliant. I mean, it does what a horror film is supposed to do, but I don't like it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> oh, but no, Sam Neill again giving a great performance and just really. I mean, like again, just giving his, just giving the gusto, taking yeah. this material really seriously. And knowing what to do, just having that really great instinct of knowing exactly how to play. I mean, this film in particular, if those performances were not right, it would have just fallen over. It would have been either too laden with irony or would it, it would have been too po-faced and too serious. But it's just on that very fine balance where it just works. 
Mm. It's interesting. Now I'm thinking about it, how similar those three roles are that he took on Trent mm. in this, um, whatever the guy's name is in Jurassic Park, and then um, whatever the guy's name is in Event Horizon. <laughs> I don't want that's Alan Grant in, uh, in Jurassic Park, but in uh, Event Horizon, I can't quite remember. Doctor something. Doctor yeah, something, yes. Yeah. But in, in all three, he's kind of a, um, he's a, he's a slightly untrustworthy slightly unpleasant um kind of establishment figure who goes into an outer situation with a with a hefty degree of skepticism mm -hmm. bordering on scorn or out, yep. you know, outright contempt who gets sucked into a, a, an entirely different kind of reality and ends up sort of representing it sort of being taken over by it obviously it's less marked in jurassic park because that's just yeah. a, you know that's that's spielberg in full sort of soft cuddly mode yeah um but they're they're, they're very similar roles I of think course you are always something... uh, uh, you know the, the, first, the first thing yeah. you make a splash with is is often going to dictate a lot. and of course his big breakthrough was damien thorne of course so oh, I, I guess oh, yeah. things God, will, yeah. the, the, the logic of his casting is, is there i mean and um I mean, he does it well. <laughs> oh, he's brilliant in that film. It's just a shame that he's in a very, 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 very bad film indeed. <laughs> oh, you yeah, mean it's, Omen it's, 3? <laughs> oh, the Omen, Omen 3, 3. Yeah. Oh, oh. yeah. Wow. Great central performance, great music. Everything yep. else is terrible. Everything yeah. else is dire. <laughs> they really, oh, they really throw that one away. It's a shame. Because actually, <laughs> it, it, it's really the very, very confusing ending. Um, where it's yes. so lackluster. Yeah. You think, this is, you this think is like, Dr. Damron, for Christ's sake. Well, this is the rapture. What's going that, on? It's that whole thing where you're like, well, if Christ could just do that anyway, then who cares about the Antichrist? He's not even that much of a threat, right? Uh, just let him get on with it. Mm. It's very shame. Was, it, it, yeah, sorry, go on, Joe. It, was, it also becomes the. I, I think it's um, it's the the female lead that stabs him, isn't it? In the end, with yeah. the with the knife. So, yeah. So yeah, it, it so, also yeah. just becomes the I'm over my nasty boyfriend plotline again, doesn't it? <laughs> 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 I mean, that's another interesting thing about this film. Of course, it avoids certain cliches that you thought you you might assume it would play into, given the nature of its of its references and influences. Which is, there's Trent is almost asexual. Mm. Trent is an almost asexual character. He doesn't have any interest, not only in sex, but widely in humanity or in romance or anything. He is a complete cynic on every level, detached no, and removed does, from reality. He, he does kind of hit on styles, doesn't he? He does, um, but it doesn't seem first. to be sexual. It seems to be almost like like a dominance move and when yes. she when that when that's turned around when she becomes sort of hypersexual towards him because kane is writing her that way it's an assault right yeah he it's, doesn't like it at all oh yeah. he doesn't know yeah. yeah which is interesting yeah it is fascinating given the cliches that you know trent would is obviously aware of within this fiction um mm. it, it's almost like by that point he's so aware of the threat um, of, you know, in his mind anyway, becoming yeah. fiction, being sick, sucked into the fiction. Little does he know that, you know, that's that it's ship has sailed. He, yeah. he was always, he was always a fictional character, yeah. but uh, he, that's what he's worried about. He's worried about becoming the character because, um, and that's why he's, he's fighting her off because he doesn't want to, um, go down the, the road of that hackneyed plot line. And also, I mean, that's a theme of the, of the film as well, isn't it? it? It's, it's sort of the core of his character. You get it all the way through. Nobody pulls my strings. I know what I am. I know who I am. There's this identity mm. crisis at the heart of it, which of course, obviously Kane is writing. That's part of who he is. <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean, it's, uh, you know, the, the, I think the film is very conscious of being free will and determinism, author and subject, God and man. And it goes <laughs> in that, in that kind of order. Really. Yeah. <laughs> but it's, uh, yeah. But, but but that yeah. what you were just saying, George, about um, you know the uh, 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 Trent himself, which of course then spills out because the whole film really is, you know, uh, you are the consumer who becomes consumed. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, he is that he is the fictional character who is reminded he's a fictional character, yeah. and 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 this is what I love about Carpenter. Again, it, it it's coming almost back to what we said at the top. You know, he'll do it in a very take Jack's way of putting it unpretentious way in yeah. this schlocky way and yet this is this is big stuff i mean we're full we're into the full society of spectacle stuff in here you know masses of people who have a stake in a, in this adjacent reality or i mean well, i'm talking about kane's readers mm -hmm. so there's this new construct um 
Hobbs End as well, which is a sort of reification of it. And they all have this microcosm with agreed parameters and structures. So it's like fandom. Mm. And, I mean, you see it in gaming, you see it in uh, in, in uh, fandom for, for certain programs and franchise and things like that. That kind of intense world building. Mythology, of course, the idea of shared fiction becoming reality. I mean, then he's like, He's jumping into things like foyer back then, you know, man yeah. creates a totem pole, prostrates himself, believing it to be a symbol of a greater narrative or a god. You know, it, it's that it's my favorite kind of doing big themes. You do them um, uh, as, as, if they're, as if they're not big themes. You don't mm -hmm. you don't yes. spell out the words big with a big B and a big <laughs> I and a big G. You just do them. And you and it, it therefore it's it's charming and at the same time there's so much to dig into and that's why I think his films are worth coming back to Prince of Darkness which exact, we did already. Yeah, it's the exact opposite of the Christopher Christopher Nolan approach, which is you know exactly. you have a character yeah. to you you get you you torturously crowbar the script to the point where a character tosses a coin for no particular reason that has <laughs> anything to do with their character or the plot or anything, and then you have the characters stand around explaining to each other the the thematic sim uh, <laughs> significance and the symbolism of coin tossing and stuff like that. Yeah. Whereas um, this version of filmmaking is just you you throw in as many things that feel symbolic and feel yeah. like they fit together, and then you let you let that get on with it. You let the aesthetics get on with it. Yeah, yeah it's something I, I love. It's, it's 1994, yes. so this is a proper old swipe at L. Ron Hubbard, Scientology, mm -hmm. and it's it's in excuse the pun it's in the wake of Waco. I mean yeah. that that's in living memory. Things like Waco, and you know cain using the bible itself as a work of fiction to establish you know this bigger more terrifying thing you know big cosmic horror stuff but it, it that that 94 ness of it really came back when i thought oh my gosh you know we, uh, scientology was really um in the discourse at, at that yeah, time yeah, yeah. So we're we're edging towards sort of matrix territory here, aren't we? At this point, there is this like grand existential. We're crisis. almost blue pilling, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, in all pilling, of culture, yeah, there is this existential crisis going on. He's hinting at it in Prince of Darkness. We talked about it, if you remember. There is that sense in the in the 1980s, certainly in 1987, that things are failing, that tradition has failed, tradition is wrong, that everything is collapsing around us. This is the point where it's happened saturation is setting in and now there is nothing to trust it's almost like again it's, it's almost like it's postmodern. it's baudrillardian isn't it yeah and of course in between is, yeah. prince of darkness and this movie although it's not part of the apocalypse trilogy it might as well be it might as well have been an apocalypse saga you do have they live as well yeah of uh, course. which is of yeah. course very much about you know media influencing people to conform to the will of a you know plutocratic democracy to corporations even when you can see the degradation so we're back into Candyman territory <laughs> you know people are in that film main characters are sleeping rough in tents while these huge monolithic yeah. skyscrapers keep the rich off the filth of the streets again you know, mm -hmm. Candyman. and this film madness continues that when you have the i mean i love the 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 element of the of the publisher the charlton heston character yeah. ratcheting up fears about how kane's novels aren't safe for readers yeah. to make a fucking profit to make a profit right uh, it's yeah. like this is so and rich the, the lovely detail that it does start out as a scam uh -huh. uh, at least as far as he's concerned that's great. Yeah, um, that is one. It's a nice wrinkle, isn't it? And it does do that a couple nice of wrinkle, times yeah. where it just, it seems to, it, it just goes to the point where you're thinking, well, maybe there is something else going on here. Maybe it isn't like a supernatural or metaphysical thing. And then, of course, it immediately flips back. There's that wonderful sequence with the church, you know, where um, Trent says, look, if we're living in Hobbes End, as Sutter Kane writes it, there should be a church outside that window with gold spires and black onions on the top yeah. and then <laughs> um style says you didn't you didn't read closely enough the view is from the east you're and not course, sufficiently yeah you, you're not you're you're not a true fan john yeah. you didn't you didn't it's interesting the text it? she's she's the she's cassandra <laughs> she? happens she's in this a film. Fan. yeah that's yeah. that's what i like about styles she she doesn't admit it but she's she's obviously a fan she's Clearly. she's the editor but she's the reader as well she's into it and she's almost um, complicit as well. There's something about the way that character is written and the way she almost plays into what Kane is doing. And of course, I mean, it's it swings and roundabouts. So Kane is writing her at that point, so she's whatever he wants her to be. But there seems to be a suggestion almost that 
she gets in she gets why she gets she understands that this is just the way it is now this is yeah. reality well, she's now. the dramatically she's the representation of the connection between the reader and the publisher really mm -hmm. i mean it makes perfect sense if you think about it the editor is the person who reads the text and engages with the text on the part of the the first person that does so and they do it on the part of the corporation that's thinking about putting the the the, the text into into mass production mm -hmm. so as that as that figure she's the one that is the the natural figure to represent that connection between um the, the the mass producer and the consumer and she is she's she's got a very ambiguous relationship to the text yeah and uh, in in that in that respect because she's she's kind of working for two masters if you know what i mean you know kane and the publisher at the same time and her her loyalties are divided between them and yeah. she's also the dramatization of that thing the, the the thing about the publishing company designing a scam where kane disappears uh -huh. and then th then that goes wrong it, they they stop understanding what's what's happening that's a cameo of a narrative that's been crafted that gets out of the control of the person that's trying to yeah. that's writing it essentially mm -hmm. yeah, and she yeah. dramatizes she dramatizes that she is the the um she is essentially the author or one of the authors of the story of mm -hmm. the disappearance of Sutter Kane the author just before his new novel comes out um and that story gets away from her she yeah. she discovers essentially that somebody else is writing it and she plays it beautifully as well. The act, the actor plays it absolutely beautifully when they emerge into Hobbs End, and that you don't know at that point as the audience that they're not supposed to find it. That's not part of the scam, mm. but they did. They do. They're there. Yeah, they do end up. That's I mean, right. it, it's a bit of a joke, of course, because you have that wonderfully weird sequence where she looks out of the window and they're driving over like what looks to be sky, like a storm, um, and then they yes. rattle across the bridge. And she says, <laughs> she says to Trent, "You drive." Yeah, it's brilliant. I mean, that that, that is, that's that's Wizard of Oz that is the by Grease. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. <laughs> well, um, back also, of the wardrobe. Back Narnia, of the wardrobe. That's the crossover point, you know, from that's one it. reality. Into but the also, it really struck me, and it could have just been purely accidental on the production design. But when they turn up in Hobbs End and the layout of the place with with the with the bridge with the shack, reminded me completely of Beetlejuice. It has yes. the same, and yeah. it's like, oh, well, that's yeah. also about, um, you know, a, a, a new plane of existence that that of that sort yeah. of uh, inveigles its way, but. I mean, it's amazing the extent to which things get to be in the cultural air and they, they show do. up again and again and again that's from all texts it is. from, yeah, from the same period and same rough sort of circumstances of production. And yeah. you can be even outside of the, um, the genre it's in. I mean, one of the things I, it kept occurring to me was, um, you know, if you've got this collective unconscious made up of Kane stories, the, mm -hmm. these elements being reified. And, uh, uh, and so I got a lot of the 60s show The Prisoner from that you know because there is a there is a reading of the old 60s patrick mcgoohan the prisoner that suggests the character he plays this number six is that his exposure to the really the madness of late 20th century geopolitics basically results in him remapping the world in microcosm as mm -hmm. this place yeah. the village yeah, yeah, the, yeah. Uh, the place that is smaller easier to gauge the limits of and which it, it therefore becomes easier to either fight or reject or even succumb to leading um and it's a self enclosed, inescapable small village as well. Exactly. And from uh, just throughout like the 90s, one. they were they were like, oh, we, we, you know, there should be a prisoner film of a prisoner film. Well, In the Mouth of Madness is your prisoner film without having to fuck up doing the prisoner. It's kind of, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. And it's, um, of course, famously at the end of The Prisoner in Fallout, you know, he does meet number one and tears the, mm -hmm. the mask off. And there's a there's a monkey mask underneath. And then he tears yeah. that off and it's his own face underneath. Yeah. yeah. He is he is clearly the one that's been in control of it the mm -hmm. entire time. Exactly. The author the writer. If you like. the author yeah, yeah. and the story's got the out of character. control and it sent yeah. him crazy you know it's 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 yeah. he's his personality is fractured as a result as is Kane. so it's it like is, you know, uh, very well, often it's, it's better not to do is, to, it's it's obviously nigel neal because of the name yes, um, yes, and of it's uh it's beetlejuice and it's the it's, the, it's the village from the prisoner yeah. and it's, and it's um, the, craft, the little it's innsmouth you know. yeah and yeah. it's also the little it main town yes, from really stephen is. king isn't it it's, yeah, it's yeah, Derry absolutely. and yeah, yeah. 
Yeah. <laughs> Castle Rock. Yeah, it's Castle Rock. Castle right? Rock. The touch of Salem, you know, it's it's all there. But it, it's funny because Neil, obviously, he made that joke, didn't he, about Martin Quatermass and the Prince of Darkness as being the screenwriter. <laughs> but <laughs> the, the pit, Quatermass and the pit, you know, again, you can you can really feel how things uh, become analogous because the pit, of course, is all about the mem the plot is about the memory of of martian culture erupting yes. in our world when activated in a metaphysical by... way right it's yeah. so weird it's all yeah it's such so you a have this idea. You know, mob with martian race memory trying to ethnically cleanse all those people around it who don't have that race memory you know, so that it's a colony by proxy a new reality and it's here again it's it's yeah, kane is trying to create a colony by proxy mm -hmm. um and and then you know the 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 old one the Hobbs H O B rather than H O B B they're released yeah they, they come through the cracks they come it through, becomes I, their I world, them, right. they come through the door of a church I mean, yeah, that's <laughs> great that's brilliant that's question, it, 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 this leads directly to a question that I really want to ask you to to uh -huh. to give me your your opinion on which is that are there old ones that Sutter Kane releases. Or are the old ones that come through his creation? Does he bring them into being, or do, essentially, does he bring them into being, or do they find him and use him as a conduit? I was thinking about this at the beginning before That's we came on. This is it is an robberus, isn't it? It's hard to, because of the nature, the metaphysics of the film. It may not be an either or. It's hard to say, right? Mm. What comes first, the chicken or the egg? You know, it's the snake eating its own tail. It's it's almost impossible to answer. I mean, given my Absolutely. proclivities, I, I I would instinctively tend towards the latter, not because it's right, mm -hmm. simply because it appeals to me more. <laughs> uh, but that that's all. That's that's about as much as I can. I love the idea that the, latter, the old ones. Sorry, the latter being, being that he invents them. No, no, that they are that he's the conduit for them. They, they are they, actually they exploit what he is. Yeah, they're out there. Yeah. Um, I think because that's just, that's just that just that's just a vibe thing. That's not I, because I think me, you know, yeah, 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 it's yeah. just me. <laughs> There's almost an awful power fantasy element um, in me that where Sutter Kane is almost like a character, uh, like a self insert. I mean, given yeah. the given the opportunity. <laughs> to rewrite reality with your fiction it's like uh, yeah there's a yeah. part of me that would not be there's able to appeal. resist that faustian mm. bargain i'm afraid i mean and there's something wider to talk about here as well isn't there i mean okay what what sutter kane the new world that sutter kane is bringing about is horrific it's absolutely horrific but the thing about one of the things this film makes absolute commentary about is the nature of horror fiction in this now whatever you can imagine whatever a horror writer imagines it is always codified horror it's always horror that operates along certain rules and therefore is controllable right the stuff that's happening in like geopolitics and culture and whatnot which is awful and not within control and is completely corrosive is not that's horror that's the real horror in a bizarre way this new world it may be just yeah. better that's certainly yeah. trent's perspective right mm. yes gets, exactly because uh, we have we have that speech from earlier in the film where he essentially gives a little potted summary of yeah. the the the, uh, the the way the late 20th century looked apocalyptic to the people who were approaching the millennium doesn't he? he says we fucked everything up we fucked yeah, up the rivers and the oceans sure. and we we're fucking up our brains as well yeah um this, this is a society that is conscious of approaching apocalypse Absolutely. simply through the the normal functioning of the world that's it and that's it yeah the, the other thing the other thing about um kane's apocalypse is when you when you look at the people who are subject to it, who are getting the, the, the split double um, eyeball thing and who mm -hmm. are going crazy um, because they're, they're happy. They're yeah. enjoying themselves. They yeah. like it. It's yeah. fun. Mm -hmm. It's revelatory, actually, <laughs> isn't it? Yeah, they're passionate. The people that are mobbing bookstores and, and rioting and stuff, I mean, this they're enthusiastic. Is... They've woken up that <laughs> dreadful sort of feeling yeah. of malaise and boredom and pointlessness that, that, that people felt. Or, or at least it was a it was a narrative that was very popular at the time that that mm. that, that, that people felt this that this was kind of a an all pervading malaise in Western culture towards yeah. the end of the millennium. We're all sort of we're all permanently and terminally bored and yep. and we're just headed towards this eternal millennium of just consumption of media, mm -hmm. etc. And it's and it's all so completely flat and meaningless. You know, all the ideological striving has finished. All the grand narratives have collapsed. It's just yes. television. You know, and they're not 
they're not doing that. They're having a great time. They're yeah. passionate in about. In a sense, um, those double eyes are, are are the next layer level on from uh, the, the sunglasses from they live. They're contact lenses, but yeah. rather than yes. revealing the, okay. the grey, horrible uh, end of history, consumerism, corporatism underneath that these contact lenses provide you a glimpse into something vivid and exciting yeah. and rapacious something and meaningful yeah something, something, meaningful, meaningful. something poetic something yeah. mythic and right? it means that the film that carpenter i think subverts what seems to be a strain of the film but perhaps isn't because i think for a, a good chunk of the film it, it's sort of pushing along this idea i mean it's in a strain a, a large strain of horror and science fiction writing the idea of the cautionary tale yeah. which is a big grain of conservatism in that the power mm -hmm. of fiction the dangers of it the the pitfalls mm -hmm. of shared belief you know belief shaped reality um and then from that how the natural world and society and culture can be you know significantly rerouted by ideas that catch on the yeah. invisible hand for christ's sake the you know the higher yeah. nobility of the yeah. american imperial well. project the rapture you know shit the bed uh -huh. and yet this film is positioning itself along that line but as you both said, and I completely agree with you, it's also saying, hang on a moment, this this Stutter Kane reality is mm -hmm. it's vivid, it's it's, yeah. it's it's romantic, it's poetic, yeah. it's mythological, it's epic. Trent says or at one point, um, God is not supposed to be a hack horror writer, and of course, my, you know, I think I think a lot of our response to that is, well, why the fuck not? Yeah, you know. fool me. Yeah, yeah you could have fooled me as well. Yeah, exactly. I would, I would give any of the hackiest of hack horror writers full reign over the universe, over whoever or whatever shapes and runs it at this point. Yeah. But that Quite strain of conservatism I, I was just talking about, though, and it's a very Carpenter thing. I, I think I said exactly the same thing in Prince of Darkness when we were doing that. You, you know, that idea in horror fiction, you know, uh, or comic books or whatever, you know, the idea that these are the things that ensnare young people first. And this is you know, this is more blown up in, in American society and culture. And, and, you know, and that, you know, how it weaves its tentacles to instigate violence and godlessness mm. and all that. And Carpenter's just like, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, hell yeah there yeah. are older yeah. gods waiting mm -hmm. at the gates and he loves the idea of, of hijacking and that this... pearl clutching context and yeah you know that's why he had this alice cooper in prince of darkness for christ's sake yeah, yeah yeah this by the way is completely entangled with the entire history of uncanny fiction hauntological fiction gothic mm -hmm. fiction um i mean they do this about everything right when the when the bicycle started to become <laughs> a popular thing <laughs> yeah. um it's bicycles in this big, ridden by monsters it, yeah, the the horse lobby, the big horse lobby, um, scaremongered mm -hmm. about bicycles. You know, they yeah. cause these sorts of health problems, etc. So they do this, they do this about everything, and it's always about yeah. the it's always about the, the money in the end of the day. But it's always been said about the Gothic, right the way back yeah. when the the Gothic novel started. Um, it was mm -hmm. it the, the the cultural discourse from the establishment critics and stuff like this was always young young women shouldn't be reading stuff yeah. like this <laughs> young women shouldn't be reading mysteries of, of odolfo <laughs> or castle of otranto or uh, the monk who they, they it's bad for them it's yeah. morally degrading it's it creates, morally degrading it, yeah the entire history of it has been about that and of course as a result the entire history of it has been to some extent or another the genre itself responding yabu sucks here's yeah. another yeah. Another <laughs> <serving>. <laughs> Carpenter's so like that. Is his he might as well just have on his printed on his t shirt. Yeah, it is fucking scary. What are you gonna do? <laughs> Get some more. <laughs> but it it is something that Carpenter does consistently throughout his career, isn't it? He plays with conservative situations and ideas to subvert them. He does it in Halloween. Yes. Yes, he does. That That is exactly what he does. I mean, Mouth of Madness sort of being this cautionary tale against, I suppose, you know, blindly swearing loyalty to things or whatever, brands, companies, people, a person in Stutter Kane's uh, case, uh, you know, oh, you must examine it first. You, you know, you mustn't leave yourself open to harmful fantasies and all that. Mm -hmm. It is doing that. But, oh boy, it's it's having its cake and eating it because it is, as we've said, it's also saying, well, hang on a minute. Let's unpack what it is that trent has found himself in mm -hmm. uh what what let's let's unpack what it is that kane has either created or has been involved in creating you know because at least the old ones if it is if it is that choice we make at least they want to try and change things at least they Absolutely. want to transform the world and yeah. we talk about this <laughs> well, in terms of an apocalypse working. like a create like a, a utter destruction well 
who's to say that's the case? What are they going to create after? Mm. That's what it. That's what it always looks like to them. You know, the yeah. the, um, the 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 Parisian communards were, from their yeah. point of view, storming heaven. From the point uh-huh. of view of the of the French bourgeoisie, the they were. It was the end of the world. Uh-huh. Yeah, they were destroying the world. Um, the the vi- a w- good working definition of villain in Western fiction is the character that wants to change the status quo. <laughs> Pretty yeah. much, yeah. And it always reminds yeah. me of the, there's a wonderful story about um, the history of the Paris Commune, which I, I, it just sticks in my head so firmly. And again, it's that idea, you know, where, where Trent is, you know, concerned about, uh, you know, d- does he retain his himself in in terms of the story? There's this fantastic. Um, anecdote about uh, in the paris commune where a a, a butcher who who was known uh, you know for being absolutely bleeding awful to his wife and kids and you know the 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 possessor of terrible reactionary ideas and within sort of three weeks of of the commune was was out um demonstrating about equal pay for women and Mm -hmm. this that and the other and this whole idea that you know ideas can change that people mm-hmm. and things can be transformed there was this known viral, awful and that they yeah, mutate yeah. The and they mutate that they and that, yeah and, and people from the aren't... outside of course that looks like a demonic possession you know yeah. from the from the, the yeah. point of view of Thiers outside the commune looking in that's a that's a that's a satanic possession he's been yeah. infected that's what they, exactly. that's what they say it's about radical ideas they yeah. Yeah. yeah yeah but of course yeah, from another absolutely. point of view this 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 man had never been able to see beyond the parameters of that oppressive society that existed before the commune said have you ever thought about this have you ever thought about that and, and it's yeah <laughs> i wonder if maybe you know part of why i sort of the the paris commune popped into my head is because this story is partly about um a, a, a community that is sort of um separated off from the rest of the world as in mm-hmm. and is engaged in a revolutionary process yeah. isn't it and just? the terror is that it might spread outside the the um the edge of the uh, of the new commune yeah. and effectively uh, there oh. are barricades as well that effectively there is fighting in the in the streets mm-hmm. i mean it really, i mean i can understand why that's, yeah i can understand why that might have been triggered actually there's in your imagery, imagination you know there's imagery of fascist oppression there's the cop beating the homeless guy yeah you know that's right. yeah that's the it's, normality that's the, that's normality. the normality that's reality right world. And that's, that's, the, right. that's, that's the key cool. into his horror as well, isn't it? That's the transition, because that's what he has the nightmares about. That's how it gets mm. into his dreams. Yeah, yeah. The, the, the uncanny, the horror latches on to that image um, yeah. through yeah. his dreams. And that is an image of everyday, quotidian, banal, yeah, yes. everyday, yeah. real-world brutality that Trent himself walks away from. Yeah. yeah. Right back to what you just said, George. Yeah, that's the real horror. That's the real horror, yeah. And that that's the irony, isn't it? That's the irony of this kind of horror fiction. It's something Lovecraft never quite understood in his fiction. He never quite got it. You get the you got the impression that he emotionally understood it. Because he was had such passion for this outside stuff, for this outre stuff, but he didn't intellectualize it. And that's a real this shame. Is- we were talking about this a little bit when we talked with um Rowan about um in yeah. the walls of Eric's, weren't we? We were talking about how without realizing it sort of behind his own back the the great xenophobe hp mm-hmm. lovecraft is actually absolutely in love with the strange yeah. and the foreign and the and different the and the yeah. Yeah. yeah yeah it's absolutely true it is absolutely true and it's one of the the the, the key ironies to lovecraft's fiction and it's it it makes it more it makes it wonderful it makes it engaging you can see him kind of wrestling with it back and forth you know yeah. you get to the end of shadow over Innsmouth and it's like oh yes we we, we called in the federal government and mm-hmm. we had these abominations you know the town was raised to the ground and these abominations were all put in camps and destroyed yeah. the way genetic um, inferior subhumans <laughs> ought to be <laughs> you get and, it um, so, it's, all, so it's all fine but also I'm turning into a fish and I like yeah. it yeah, absolutely yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you get it all the time in almost every single one of the stories that he wrote that describes one of these outside monsters or horrors or phenomena he is so enthusiastic and in love with that phenomena yeah he's so in love with it but at the end you just get that yeah loves shoggoths Mm -hmm. he loves the color out of space he loves the old ones he loves cthulhu um but you always have to have that little bit at the end which is oh but it's it's awful it's terrible it's horrific and it'll drive you mad (laughs) what i love about the legacy of lovecraft is you've got this you've got stuff like this and stuff like clive barker for example where it's like he takes that essential dynamic and says actually no it can be 
brilliant it can be wonderful it can be revelatory even if it appears to be dark and awful it's a bit like once again we were talking about how this film does things with cinema that are reminiscent of some of the very early experimenters vertov and stuff like mm-hmm. that mm-hmm. where they were trying to work out exactly what cinema was what this media what this new medium is how it works <laughs> etc um and then that kind of got put aside because a kind of an a, an ideological consensus arose within uh, the producers of the medium as to as to what it was and mm-hmm. what it could do and so on and then so towards and, and a little bit later on the, some of those some of those same techniques from very early cinema they get picked up again yeah. and they kind of get picked up for kind of for bigger things in a way yeah. with, with these with these older arguments about form having been kind of settled or at least provisionally said it's a bit like that isn't it it's a bit like lovecraft puts cosmic horror of course cosmic horror in weird fiction existed before him but he puts yeah. it on a very particular footing you know it's never the same post lovecraft no. as it is before and um and along come a later generation of people that pick up this amazing discourse that that he leaves forever inflected in his way mm-hmm. but they start to you know they, they kind of take his personal neurosis out of it don't they yeah yes. that's exactly yeah. it they understand yeah. it emotionally they understand they they get the fact that he actually underneath it all loved this stuff loved yeah. it to bits and had and such he, passion he, for it he felt you know he he was writing about shoggoths because that's what he felt like he's he, he yeah. feels like he is a shoggoth he and um a, a kind of a, a you know the next move in in terms of the development of the literary form is to is to is to notice that and point it out and then say okay so now what where do we go from here where do we go from the fact that we can identify with the shoggoth but it's such the, a the, strain the of um, conservative thinking isn't it the uh the um obsession with feeling clean yeah that's psychologically exactly, yeah. and yeah. physically being afraid even, of your own you know. mind being afraid of your yeah. own mind of what you think of what you imagine of what you fantasize right i mean certainly so that's the a lot of um, fascistic propaganda and everything you know based yes. on i mean actually literalized cleanliness you know yeah the, you know soap you know being clean mm-hmm being white yeah. really interesting when he writes force. about evil he writes about different forms of evil and he writes about um angelic and demonic forms of evil in the way i believe it's the angelic form of evil feels that it has to um you know eradicate every speck of dirt every yeah. speck of meaningless material um which is kind of what um i think he talks about iago you know and how he, mm-hmm. he feels that he has to eradicate or it might be the other way around actually no it's the other way around because iago wants to eradicate othello precisely because he is meaningful he is full of meaning and and (laughs) and, uh significance which is a sort of reproach to iago but yeah he's he's very good on this on the on the discourse of cleanliness Mm. to reactionary politics which is it's, it's obsessed with um the idea of dirt and you mm-hmm. know tincture and uh, infiltration and infection and of course that goes with virality the idea yeah. of the of the evil force as a viral one yeah that spreads and, it's in, and, in, in the, and undermines in, the world in the extraordinary it's in lovecraft and then the more um the more material it's in it's in fleming another writer whose mm-hmm. psychological makeup is utterly <laughs> fascinating and terrifying all at once we need I mean, those it. books are extraordinary to read the bond books of the 50s because they are such an insight onto an author whose whose psychology is extraordinary he has some very strange ideas about like marginalized demographics doesn't he <laughs> but it's way he, he himself appears on the page and all his neuroses and all yeah, his contradictions yeah. Do- appear on the doctor page. no is weird fiction oh, I think, this, <laughs> it really is so many fucking tentacles and claws and feelers and yeah. antennae and you know <laughs> biting pincers and and you know there's there's piles of bird shit everywhere it's 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 yeah. weird fiction doctor yeah, no, it's it really with is. sort of metal, metal claws for hands stuff. and shit like this and his heart's on the wrong side it's bizarre it's really <laughs> weird isn't it <laughs> it's a shame how much the films clean that stuff up actually yeah. because you, you know you do go back to these incredibly you know racist imperialist misogynistic novels but they are fascinating and mm-hmm. as you say no is weird no is a weird really novel. Is. you know yeah. in the true in the sense of with a I'm w, writing a, w. I'm, I'm writing this sexy spy thriller what i really need now is a scene where the the the, the macho male hero um has to worry about a gigantic centipede crawling uh, all over his junk. That's what, <laughs> yeah. obviously what we do next. Yeah, yeah clearly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, uh, that's... Uh, 
<laughs> but you, you were saying earlier, Jack, about you know the, the, it, it conscious of its um, its medium. Is, I mean, never more so than in the window scene. I think the window scene is such a triumph near the beginning of the film when he's um, where, the, where it, the window is broken by the yeah. the axe man. I mean, the you know, I love the irony with it where he's basically saying to him, "Oh, Trent, you're so good at detecting insurance scams, uh-huh. but you haven't looked out at the bloody window yeah. to see what's yeah. coming your way." <laughs> it and it's the super first clue in a shot. Way. It's, it's brilliant because shot. it gives you the first clues that you are actually watching. A novel or a piece of fiction. Well, the fact it looks like they're chatting in front of the big screen horror action flick yeah. playing behind them yes. on the cinema Absolutely. screen. Absolutely, and, and it's that idea of, of, I think, again, of exploiting that pearl clutching of, uh, you know, that 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 emerges from horror films. Uh, you know, oh, horror films cause violence. That mm-hmm. that Carpenter subverts so beautifully when the crazy axe murderer <laughs> is revealed to be Kane's literary agent. And he's trying to save the world. <laughs> Through his violence, by yeah, the way. But he's his lit agent. I mean, that, <laughs> that payoff is superb. When the, when the coin drops, it's like, yeah. oh, God, you're his literary agent. <laughs> it's really good. And, of course, I mean, you get another wonderful joke, of course, from Trent, which it, it's, it works on so many levels. It's a joke, but it also says a lot about Trent himself, where he says, um, you'd think a guy who outsells Stephen King could get better representation. Yeah. <laughs> This is probably why I kept hearing Pierce Brosnan, and we've just talked about Fleming, because he gets these kind of Bond quips. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, that, yeah. That's pure, yeah. like, end of the scene Bond quip. Like, it's all the way through get a better well, literary agent, you know? <laughs> I mean, it's all the way through. I mean, like from the, his introduction, where he's you know shrieking and attacking the orderlies, you get the the I'm sorry about the balls. It was a lucky shot. Um, <laughs> you get that my well, probably one of my favourite lines where the um, the administrator turns on the uh, the tannoy system and it's the carpenters. <laughs> John Glover is so extraordinary oh, in this he's film great as well. In this it's film, a, it's isn't like he really gets the he, assignment. He brings <laughs> something to this. I mean, it's a very I mean, it's it's such a marginal role, isn't? I mean, on the page, it's nothing. It's like it's less than like ten minutes of screen time, and somehow he leaves this indelible mark. And and it's the same with David Warner because he's only sort of in the framing yeah. bits, really. And but he has this wonderful line in kind of uh, just enough wryness comes through, uh-huh. uh, not too much. He doesn't push the gas at all. Uh-huh. Uh, but there's a sort of wryness because because really John Glover's taking care of that that side of it so yes, he has to definitely. to to be the other half of the double act he has to be the straight man yeah. but it's that just that kind of um polite amusement that <laughs> david warner has when, <laughs> when every time that he's in the room with Sandy, you know um how do you say um I like the crosses. <laughs> Things like that. It's like, you know, you know, it's just that I'll play gentle. Yeah. yeah. Um, but I mean, that's again, you know, we were talking about antecedents and things. I mean, uh-huh. it's interesting that, you know, you've got the schema there of Invasion of the Body Snatchers, which is, uh, you know, I, yeah. I, I'll play yeah. a key science fiction film for Carpenter. I mean, he used Thing from Another World in mm-hmm. Halloween. And of course, he, having Obviously, put shots yeah. of it in Halloween, he then <laughs> makes the thing. Makes the but, thing, yeah. You know, kicking off with, you know, our, our protagonist in the asylum, in in, in the hospital an invasion and then flashback i mean mm-hmm. that's pure body snatches and then of Absolutely. course the end com- sort of evokes day of the triffids in reverse with Trent <laughs> getting out of the hospital has all the hysteria and the horror has happened you know don't uh-huh. look at the comet don't read kane's book it's all happened yeah, yeah and yeah. then as you know as jack mentioned earlier you get that fantastic scene of of basically he goes into a cinema watching us watching him watching himself that's brilliant isn't it because you he is actually watching the film that you're watching. That's film. What's so great. <laughs> and that, of course, I mean, that makes the fiction bleed out, doesn't it? That opens yeah. the gates in a way. It makes it more than meta. It's it's almost that thing of like, it's like, it's that Japanese horror thing that somehow you could become infected by watching it. Yeah. It's great. And also, that Greyhounds, is- Greyhound buses are so romanticized in american culture uh-huh. uh, i mean you know even from songs springsteen's run a, yeah. r- run a, a slew of songs about greyhounds and of course um the, the very famous one which is simon and garfunkel america oh, where it, it's garfunkel, um, it's yeah. greyhounds are america microcosm and yet it shows yeah. all the yeah. madness you know that man over there in the gabardine suit as a spy his mm-hmm. you know his bow tie is really a camera and all that kind of thing and this 
putting the horror into Greyhounds. Brilliant. Uh, I mean, the the moment when he wakes up screaming is incredible. And then the blue. That has become a bit of a meme, you know. Did I ever tell you my favorite color is blue? That has become a meme. It's it's <laughs> it, uh, understandably it's a great moment. It's a great sequence. But it's also a moment where Carpenter is very open about the fact that he's not. He's also talking about himself. He's also <laughs> talking about being a film director. Yeah, and absolutely. The the experience of having that kind of um, power yeah. over the. You know, if he decides to put a blue filter over yep. a scene, <laughs> then he's it, literally. Yeah. He's just decided to put characters into a different, a different time or a different mm-hmm. space or, or, or just, you know, a different visual environment. Yeah. And it's the, the character that he's doing it to in this one just becomes conscious of it. Yeah, he looks around it. and he sees, he sees the world as uh-huh. it is seen through a blue filter. I mean, how can, you, yeah. how can it's, you have a film by way of Lynch, isn't it? Yeah. How can you have a film that is similar to, yeah, it's, it's the blue velvet thing. How yeah. can you have a film that is simultaneously, you know, uh Fellini's eight and a half I mean there's so much in there about Carpenter and at the same time it basically borrows the structure of the old Cushing film The Creeping Flesh <laughs> <laughs> yeah and it's also you know? that bit is, is also a very um cinematically literate moment because it's yeah. just a filter it's just and that's yes. those were the earliest um they really they were the earliest effects in cinema yeah. the the original Nosferatu Nosferatu yeah um it tells you that scenes are happening at night mm-hmm. because they have a blue filter over them. That's it. Filter. You know, in, in loads of, in the first um, copy of it that I saw way back in, you know, when I bought the, the, um, the VHS, when it was first released, uh-huh. none of the filters were on it. So you can't make sense <gasps> of it in the restored version that you can get now. It has the, the, the gold filters for the gold day and the blue yeah. filters for night. And so on. these were the earliest. Um, and again, we've talked about this before the way, um, Hauntology is just built into the development of the cinematic genre. The spectral mm-hmm. is just, you know, Nosferatu, um, Cabinet of Dr. Caligari, yes. um, Murnau's <sighs> Faust, all, the, all, these, all these uncanny narratives, they're essential to the development of cinema. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And to, to the extent that Carpenter is talking about cinema at that moment, he, he could have done anything if he wanted to make that point, but he chooses a yeah. blue filter. Yeah. So yeah. he goes right back to one right of the back. earliest forms of visual effects for the purposes of cinematic storytelling. Yeah. For the, for, you know, just a, a, a color effect as part of the grammar of storytelling in that medium. Mm. Yeah, and it's really particular because it's not just for Trent. It's for you as well. It's for the audience, mm. right? He has power over you too. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. He's controlling what you see. Yeah, and he and he well, does. Trent succeed. shouldn't really see it unless it's supposed to yeah. signify um, that that he's in a that he's in um, dusk or you know a, uh-huh. a, the crepuscular hour. Um, characters in the film are not supposed to see these filters. They yeah. characters in the film who are remembering <laughs> things they don't see the world suddenly go wibbly. Yes, go wibbly. Yeah, <laughs> they don't hear. The <laughs> you know, they're not supposed to. <laughs> <laughs> but that, of course, is something that it, it's the way the mythology is built into the form of the film, isn't it? Like it, the, the increasingly the film itself, like reality itself starts to work like a film or like a book. It's edited in that manner. Yeah. And the way the, the tension in the film between um, the way it's talking about narrative. When it talks about narrative, the tension in the film between textual storytelling and visual storytelling is really interesting. There is a mm-hmm. very interesting moment where Styles go. I think it's the first time she goes to the church to see Cain, ah, and he's talking yes. to her, and he shows her the new manuscript, and uh-huh. he, he sort of says, "You." He says something like, um, "You you can read it now," or something like that, and he 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 actually quite violently sort of thrusts yeah. her head down towards the manuscript. And of course, what she she's not reading it. What she's actually oh. doing is looking at it. Watching and what she it. gets is essentially a movie trailer. She gets yeah. a series of very short clips of the things yeah. that are happening in the story as images. Mm-hmm. So that the film is very intentionally there, bleeding, um, reading a narrative in text form into yes. watching a reality in yeah, yeah. Uh, watching a narrative in visual form. It's doing that very deliberately. So and it's it almost about adaptation. Its way later on, of course, by making the whole pivot with the with the film version, yes. which come out, comes out at a ridiculously quick clip. You know, there's yep. no, you wouldn't have a film version of a book that quickly after its release. <laughs> Definitely the, not. <laughs> 
I mean, the, 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 he was ripe to make a, a self-referential joke. It wasn't even really, yeah. you know, Stutter Kane saying, I'm thinking about selling the film rights to Carpenter. <laughs> 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 you probably, you probably, you know, I wonder if that was ever mooted. He was like, oh, maybe it's a bit much. Yeah, <laughs> maybe that's a bit too on the nose, right? <laughs> there is a degree of restraint because he doesn't do that. He, he doesn't put like starring Sam Neill mm-hmm. on the movie poster. He puts oh. starring John Trent. John Trent, doesn't it? right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean this is this is 1994. Right? So this is pre-Scream. Mm. This is pre-Scream, and that's really interesting because it is dealing with very similar ironies. Yeah, yeah, that is really the, interesting. The, yeah, the thing I always feel about this one is that Carpenter is actually he's trying to not do the thing where we feel like we're part of the story. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, where the the film breaks the fourth wall, yeah, and he still sort keeps of implies, something erected in place, doesn't he? Yes, yeah. What what it wants to show you is not a not the barriers between you and the text breaking down. <laughs> it just wants the text to show you the barriers between text and its own textual reality breaking yeah. down. That's right. Yeah. 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 I mean, quite literally, of course, you get the, that brilliant moment, which I, I think is just a brilliant arresting image of Kane ripping himself open and mm. the words, the text is inside. It's actually on the pages. I love that. It's interesting that in order for a visual reality and a, and a material reality to come into being, the, the text kind of has to be destroyed. It has yeah. to be torn open. It has yeah. to yeah, be yeah. ripped apart. In fact, apart, the, the, this will, I know you've watched this recently, George, and mm-hmm. I was saying earlier about the Lynch thing. There's a very significant scene. It's not a spoiler, um, because I know you haven't seen it, Jack, but uh, there's a very significant scene in one of the episodes of Twin Peaks, The Return, where you get a character who assassinates two other characters. She goes into an office. Yes. And she shoots... And the first thing you go is that's a really unconvincing special effect of two people being shot. It's because it's not, you realize they haven't got bullet holes in them. Mm-hmm. They're like paper that's been yeah. torn. It's text again. It's mm-hmm. almost exactly what Carpenter does here at the end of, in the mouth of madness. It's Lynch's way of saying, well, those characters are done with because they are, they 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 are constructs. Yeah. They, they, and, and this is a text. This is a fabric. And well, this so happens, you, doesn't it? I mean, this yeah. happens like very, very literally in the film. I mean, there's the when uh, Trent goes back to um, the publisher, um, he says like um, this: "This woman, this this styles that you say I sent with you. Ah, well, she was written out. Yeah, she was written out. Yeah, it's actually one of the the, the joys of, um, uh, and I'm, I'm I'm probably pretty sure you'll agree too." George, having seen it recently, of, of, of Twin Peaks, The Return, is David Lynch's absolute love of bad special effects oh and my, how he turns well, them into so, points oh, of significance. It's they wonderful. become significant. They become mythological. Yeah. They become part of the way this world... Oh, the, uh, I, I don't want to say too much because I don't want to spoil it, but I, I loved it so much. They're the kind of effects I that loved it you know so much. A, 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 a quality filmmaker will. I can't possibly possibly put that Could on. And with possibly a, do and this. Lynch does it, and he yeah. makes something of it. Just um, goes for it. Stop yeah. motion animation. <laughs> you know some of the ropiest looking effects imaginable. But again, it's part of the the weave. It's part of the fundamentals of what this reality or this rather this series, the sequence of realities is. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and rather, as with In the Mouth of Madness, it's how they join, overlap, fail to join, mm. fail to overlap. I mean, again, it, it, it doesn't give anything away about um, about the series. It's not mm. a spoiler. But I love the fact that um, uh, the, all, uh, lots, all those sequences with Audrey, it's like, this is an off-Broadway play that's yeah. just been jammed into it's just jammed the in rest here, of the right? And the fact that you're deliberately having references to people who you don't meet. Because, it, um, although I do think he probably, in a way that Carpenter doesn't in this film, slightly hedges his bet with that she keeps going to uh, to her husband, doesn't she? Or, uh, I wish Billy were here. Uh-huh. Well, that's Billy uh-huh. Zane. Yeah, because yeah. no one remembers the fucking character Billy Zane played in Twin Peaks <laughs> second series because it was rubbish. But people remember that Billy Zane was in yes. it. Yes. So they just don't call him by his character they anymore. They Billy? just call him it's Billy. So, it's, uh, honestly, it's... <laughs> I do. I mean, it sounds interesting because I wrote a. 
I wrote an essay about um, the first season of the television show Legion, which uh-huh. does something similar to that. The, the, it, it sets itself, I think it's supposed to be a kind of an alternate reality with a, a kind of ultra dominant 60, long 60s aesthetic. It's like mm-hmm. the era when, because it's related to the X-Men comics. And right, I think it's right. it's saying like, in this version of reality, in this version of history, the the era of the Silver Age comics um, <laughs> carried on because it's like it's like it's kind of aesthetically reckoning with the idea of a world in which the the X Men really existed, the mutants right, really existed, okay. and stuff like that. And part of what it's doing, aside from doing that sort of thing with its production design, with the way people's clothes and people's furniture, et cetera, et cetera, and decor. Uh-huh. It's not just doing that. It also kind of does it with the special effects. The special yeah. effects in Legion are, they're, they're quite deliberately quaint and archaic <laughs> in some way. Um, oh, and um, yeah, I, I wrote an essay about that at the time, way back oh, when. So yeah, it, it makes me more keen than ever to get back to um, uh, the, the new Twin Peaks. Oh, honestly, yeah. Jack, I, 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 I think it may be one of the best TV shows I've ever seen. I mean, I have said for a I've long time that, that, uh, along with Hannibal and Deadwood it's yeah. it's it's one of the it, of the three I, best things i've seen this century the balls of it um, it's the it's the sheer yeah. cojones of the thing it, it 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 does things that nobody should get away with well he he basically invented 21st century television in 1989 and now he's yeah. gone and done it and done yeah. something else where you like yeah, oh, yeah, what, yeah. What, what do you do now what do you what do you do now? <laughs> he's I, to do where it is this 75 you know, year old man i know he like, said he was done he, only did he said he was yeah. done he, he only did it because said was... they said well it, we're, we're gonna do it without you if you don't do it and he said okay i'll have to do it then. <laughs> and then they still try to to um to fob him off because yeah. they 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 he got in touch with everyone and and everything, and then it was uh, a case of, oh, well, maybe David, you shouldn't do the whole season. You shouldn't direct it. Mm. And he, well, I'll walk then. He said, yeah. and then they got covered. And it, it's interesting how I, I, it's something I, I, I think we discussed in a private chat that 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 I'd said that um, you know, in a way, he David Lynch is is where very popular if not populist cinema intersects with the avant-garde he's not mm-hmm. he's neither one thing nor t'other really and, and that so it means that he can get films out there yeah. but despite his pedigree despite having made the films he has made he still really struggles yeah. he still really struggles to get things done the return was hard work um, mm-hmm. to, to get his vision. I mean, there, there was a lot of just basic him fighting execs and saying, this is the way I'm going to do it. Yeah. it there's a very famous sequence of um, where the people on the staff, the, literally the day-to-day staff, I have to say, I think he handles it brilliantly because um, he, uh, he he's shooting a scene and he wants to do it the way he does things. <laughs> and he has a, a, a quite kind of pushy um, production assistant who says, right, I think we need a punch in there. We need to cut that scene by about 45 seconds. Now, he could have pulled a Kubrick, which wouldn't have uh, been very good on his own. And actually, I, I I was quite struck by how he handled this because it was a young woman who was... Mm-hmm. Um, and he's he was obviously frustrated. And yet what he did was he completely pulled attention off her and what she said. And he turns to the rest of the crew... Uh-huh. And just says, you know, he says, I'm sorry, guys. He said, I, I don't know what is wrong with everyone here. The scene will go on as long as it goes on. And if I don't wish to do any close ups, I'm not going to do them. <laughs> and I thought you've actually handled that very well because you could have just been the yeah. asshole director and turned on her and, you know, destroyed her for the rest of the fucking week, you know, mm-hmm. uh, because she's basically doing her job for the execs. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but it, but all this is playing out in real time. It's a behind the scenes moment. And the fact that he has the wherewithal to, to deal with that in the way he does in the moment when he must be feeling like he must be annoyed. This is my yeah. fucking vision, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's like, wow, it's a real moment of mastering control, you know, without, yeah. uh, without offending anyone. It's, it's a really great moment. And, you know, uh, kudos to him, but uh, yeah, it, I, I it, it's um 
it is an extraordinary piece of work. I mean, it, it's breathless. Uh, I mean, uh, it just completely breathless. It it knocked me on my ass. It really did. And I can also see why people would be intensely frustrated by it. Why they would <laughs> oh, find it obnoxious. It's, it's, it's um, designed to be, isn't it? It's you designed know, to... slow. And you know, all, all yeah. these things. I mean, contradictory. I completely... It deliberately inverts expectations, so totally. it gives you things that people have gotten used to in sort of streaming media and series, and then it it I doesn't give you what you want in touch with his alumni because i love this thing that uh, something must happen to people when they've been in a lynch thing because <laughs> uh, um uh, <laughs> the the lovely actor who plays big ed hurley who runs the mm-hmm. garage and then um, the original and obviously he basically after his experience on twin peaks he was quite a uh, a, a successful character actor i know mm-hmm. he'd appeared in a bond film and he was in dune yeah. of course david lynch's dick dune um and he'd been in many other things and he basically disappeared off and bought a gas station and basically became ed became ed <laughs> and he said and he tells this fantastic story he said a phone in my workshop which is basically an outside line which is nothing to do with the small town i now live in which has never rung rung one day oh for god's sake it's like a lich film in and of itself picked it up it? And Sorry, David like was on the, the end. Yeah. Yeah. So David was on the other end of the phone, and I said, "Jesus, how the how did you get this number? This phone has not rung in twenty five years." And he said, "Because <laughs> he Miguel Ferrara used to say it was always so funny because he calls everyone either uh, a, a name that he's fucked up saying. He, <laughs> he never gets their names right. He calls Kyle McLaughlin Kale. He calls <gasps> Machin Armick Matchstick." Um, and he calls, he said, Miguel Ferrara, the late Miguel Ferrara said, I knew him for years. He knew my dad. He always called me Albert um, after my character. <laughs> and he said, but he, he just, the, the phone answer, he just said, Ed, I need you. And the, and the, the, the woman who plays Lucy, Lucy Brennan, the, the receptionist at the, at the police department, she said, I remember, she said, I, she said, usually you get a text if someone is going to ring you because it's LA and that's how it works. <laughs> She said, my mobile rung with unknown number. And she said, and I answered it. And she said, I was, you know, 25 years again. She said, I was so shocked to hear his voice. And all he said was, Lucy, I need you again. She said, I somehow ended up underneath my own bed because I was so flabbergasted and excited all at once. She said, in the next minute, I was just looking at the springs on the other side of the mattress. She said, I don't even know how I got there. (laughs) But that's obviously the effect of being in a a, a David Lynch project. (laughs) Yeah, you do get the impression of Lynch that he is his own entity, isn't he? He's his own phenomena, sort of slightly apart from humanity. I mean, there's a brilliant one with um, Miguel Ferrara says about Fire Walk With Me. So the scene where David Bowie plays um, Philip Jeffries. Mm-hmm. He said, we were just about to roll. And obviously Lynch is in the scene playing Gordon Cole, um, the FBI director. <laughs> Best character and, ever in anything. Oh, he's amazing. And he just comes over to me. He said, you know, everything's set up. Everyone's been and, and David Bowie's put outside the door to come in. And, and he says, Albert? And I, yeah, 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 David. <laughs> David Bowie's in my scene. Yeah, I know. <laughs> rehearsed with him. Isn't it so cool? Isn't it cool? And then he just went on and said, but that's him totally. Said it's like this man whose head is full of really uncanny visions and magic and strangeness. And yet it's all wrapped up in this good old apple pie and, yeah. you know, exterior, you know, perfectly innocent. Mel Brooks always tells a great story about when they, I'm sorry, I'm really railroading this conversation, but when he did The Elephant Man, he said, I literally got his storyboards and his conceptions. Mel Brooks, this is, I got his storyboards and I got his conceptions and it was fucking insane and what he wanted to do and I'd never met him and I I invited him to my office and in in walked Jimmy Stewart. What the fuck? (laughs) He said he was really lovely and just sort of like, yeah, I I wouldn't mind directing this. I think it would be really good for me to, you know, do a film that's normal. He said, what the fuck about making a film about John Merrick? Are you mad? (laughs) Oh, wow. He can do it though. I mean, like you've seen a straight story, right? Oh, it's great story, yeah. yeah, it's wonderful. It's absolutely it's wonderful. What, it's what Forrest Gump should have been. Yeah, yeah. Because it's it's not sentimental. It's emotional. No, it's beautiful. Um, absolutely beautiful. Geez. And every time, bloody Harry Dean Stanton does it to me. Harry um, oh. Harry Dean Stanton's got some really great moments in Twin Peaks: The Return, and, and does, unless you two yeah. have yet to see it, I strongly, strongly advise the film Lucky. 
It is mm. one of the most extraordinary films I've ever seen. It's Harry Dean Stanton's last movie. Funnily enough, right. David Lynch is in it. Because, um, <laughs> of course, yeah, he is. Cameo. Um, and it, uh, I, I mean, a film like that normally can't happen because actors don't, use, well, people don't usually get to be that old and still mm. work. Um, but an extraordinary film with that uh, a lovely uncanny quality under what seems to be a very mundane and repetitive a narrative um mm-hmm. i strongly recommend it i mean stanton's amazing so you know and it's a piece of history it's his last movie yeah of course <laughs> I mean, 92 <laughs> it's it's mind bottles, you know? still working right it's amazing yeah. right it's incredible it's just- there's so much of him invested in it because I love what they, they used to put them on YouTube, just sort of um, conversations between Lynch and Harry Dean Stanton because they were such good friends. I, I imagine they were brilliant as well. I mean, Harry Dean Stanton is just gold because every time like David Lynch would come in and go, hi, Harry. Hi, hi David. And how are you today? There is no me. Is no me. <laughs> what are you talking about? We're not here. <laughs> you would go off into this you know, really? strongly new age philosophical <laughs> conversation about how neither of them really existed and everything was an illusion. <laughs> and it was like, and you could just see David Lynch being out oddballed. And, and <laughs> like, well, Harry, I mean, good morning would have sufficed. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, no, I, I think it's his. I think it's his masterwork. Yeah, I really I, do. I, I I cannot get over how good the new series of Twin Peaks is. And my God, you know, I'm because I, I think I've we've often talked about it as a three about you know the, the about the. It's not about being remote or, or or cold, but I really fucking hate cheap sentiment, and and cheap mm-hmm. sentiment seems to be such a kind of glue. Oh, it's such a so yeah, it's such things. a thing, isn't it? It's uh, yeah, but I can't because stand this it. was uh, because this was. Um, so enigmatic and straight i i ended up in tears a lot during the return the the bits and with I the log lady tell you why. Did for me. the bits I mean, with yeah, the log the, lady that, really did that for, for quite ob- for, you know yeah for were, obvious no, reasons. Not, no offense but for obvious reasons. but there were films there were there were moments in it where i i didn't always know why i <laughs> i'd been brought to tears it wasn't readily the information wasn't readily there to say ah yes well this is but it was much stranger it was more intangible and um but several times oh god oh god getting lacrimose again what's Mm -hmm. this or (laughs) and uh, and in terms of horror ostensibly why we're here some of the most horrifying things i've I've ever been commissioned shocking I mean, I mean that that was true of the original Twin Peaks, oh, and it's certainly yeah. true of Fire Walk with Me. Bloody hell, this is Fire this Walk is by with me far is one of my favourite. You know, oh, horror it's an incredible movies, movie. If you, it oh, is a if horror you movie. want to call it a horror movie, yeah. I think Fire it's a Walk horror movie. Beautiful. Yeah. Again, slammed on its release. Of course, it was largely hated on its release, but it's it's an amazing film. Yeah, I also yeah. think probably my my favourite Lynch film, Inland Empire. Is, oh, um, good. No, God, sorry, I don't mean in, uh, Lost Highway. Lost, Lost, Highway. Oh, Lost, Lost Highway. Highway. Lost Highway has yeah. one of the the nastiest sequences, one of the the scariest sequences I think I've ever seen. And uh, yeah, it's, it's terrifying. A, yeah, it's, it's terrifying. It's, it's film. Existentially ominous experience watching that yeah. film, and I fucking mm. love it. Yeah. In fact, there's a there's a there's a. I don't know if have, have either of you seen uh, Cache, um, Hanukkah's film Cache. No, I don't think um, I haven't. Sometimes called is hidden. No. Um, it's his best film, the French director Hanukkah. Uh, mm-hmm. It's his best movie, and. Um, it's amazing how it's like um, an alternate dimension lost highway. Ah, it's ooh. really, really like very, very, it's like, Oh my God, it's, it, it's the alternate dimension lost highway. It's incredible. <laughs> and, and lost highway has a few alternate dimensions in it itself. Oh, uh, I was going to say, yeah. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, but lost highway. I mean that, that run, you know, lost highway, Mulholland, Mulholland drive, drive and Mulholland Inland drive, empire. Yeah. They are, they're, they're, they make a, an extraordinary run. For some um, reason, I always get the titles Inland Empire and Lost Highway mixed up, but I do mean yeah. Lost Highway. Mm. That's, yeah. I think that's probably my favourite of all his films, with a, with um, Firewalk very close. I guess. Yeah, I mean, the, the, I remember being a, a, going to the cinema to see Lost Highway and absolutely freaking out when he says, <laughs> "Oh, it's uh, when he yeah. hands over the phone." Yeah, says, that's do you want the bit, to talk? That's the bit. That that bit 
sort of yes. talk to me. <laughs> it, it upsets me. It's brilliant. It's uh, brilliant. It's yeah. so frightening. It's so unsettling and disturbing. And, yeah. oh, and I tell and I don't you, it's a why. tremendous testament to Patricia Arquette for being such a smart actress because Lynch never tells his people. I mean, he gives them sides. Basically. He gives them he doesn't like, give them emotional scripts. information, doesn't yeah. he? He tells them how they're supposed to be feeling. And very often dialogue's the taken away and they're allowed to do their own, they, they extemporize or improvise. But Patricia Arquette was determined to work out what was going on in that movie. And she <laughs> sat down one day and told him, and he, and he went, <laughs> that's really good, that's it. Then. And it, she put her explanation <laughs> up online once and her explanation's phenomenal. Mm-hmm. Um, she's just like, oh, that's so smart, you know. <laughs> she said, but she, he just went, that's what you wanted to be. <laughs> yeah, that's it, right? That's the thing with Lynch's films. I mean, there is. Um, I did uh, on the back of watching the new Twin Peaks. I went and looked for just people's responses to Twin Peaks in general because I love hearing what people think. I love hearing what people think about that show. And unfortunately, one of the first things you get is this guy, this this four hour epic YouTube video, and were it just that were it just someone saying this is what i think this is my interpretation great that would be fine unfortunately it's not that it's a bit of an internet chud basically saying this is absolute this is this is what twin peaks yeah. means and it's like oh no lynch has one of my favorite you ways exactly of... the sort of thing you're talking you about are missing yeah. the point entirely lynch is a great thing he always says about when people you know i know he's, he's of course infamous for saying he won't um say anything about what his well, films mean that, there's that famous conversation isn't that interview where he says oh well you know i uh, i think that uh uh what what's what's the film eraserhead is my most spiritual spiritual film, film yeah and, would, and you, the, would you uh, like to elaborate says, on that yeah, would you like, no no <laughs> no <laughs> but he's, he says a really great thing and and, and and again it's 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 beautifully done he says look he says uh if if a couple, a young man and a young woman, go to the cinema and, and let and they see a film, it doesn't have to be one of my films, but let's say it's one of my films, and they leave and they go to a diner and they have coffee, and uh, he starts pontificating because she says, "I don't understand what happened in that movie. I don't get it," and he starts pontificating what the film means. She instinctively knows he's wrong. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's like that's it. She, that's he, it. He right? said it's instinct. He said it. My my yeah. films are really just instinct You'll it's emotional get. intelligence isn't yeah, it that's what that's what he's about, really than... doing yeah and it's very interesting that he makes that point in that way with that, that way. story as well as yeah. <laughs> yeah yeah i mean yeah he just totally gets what mansplaining is <laughs> yeah, absolutely he understands yeah he gets it i think there's a lot lynch gets there's a lot lynch gets he's a clever dude i mean in a sense lynch has got one great problem in all his film, well, the majority of his films, but it emerges from what I think is an honest and noble thing, which is uh, um, most of his films are about women suffering. Mm -hmm. And therefore mm -hmm. he does get some stick sometimes about, you know, whether, you know, his work is misogynistic, mm -hmm. but his, but his movies are, I mean, are also a great deal about rejecting white knights, about yeah. rejecting uh, uh, masculine saviors and, uh, and so on. But he, I mean, I saw an interview with him once and he said, yeah, you know, I, I can't apologize for it. The world makes women suffer. Yeah, yeah, it's true. And I mean, like, <laughs> like well, there it is. He, I mean, it, and it's encapsulated in, I mean, it's crystallized in Laura Palmer, isn't it? Mm. She yeah. is that, that, that is what she is. She's almost like the, she's not like an avatar of that or a, almost like a, a principle, a goddess of that very concept. Well, it really subverts the, the nature of the, the supposedly, um, benevolent beings of the white lodge. Mm. I mean, how benevolent are they? Were they send yeah. this girl to basically be a sponge yeah, for, for evil, for, for, evil, and, for and, suffering uh, and, and abuse. Horror. Yeah. It takes the, it takes the Christ mythology and, and just, puts it into the darkest possible absolute uh, conclusion which is yeah she's she's meant to suffer uh, yeah. and 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 good beings have done this yeah you know yeah. and it's, it's well, you're into brothers karamazov then aren't you and uh, you know uh, the the suffering of a single and the fact that it can't being. be escaped doesn't matter what you do it cannot yeah. be escaped you can literally yeah. leap to another reality yeah and you can't get away from it they can't get away from it oh wow. yeah it's a fundamental law of creation, or it's a, ooh, mm. ah, 
brilliance. It's a supreme brilliance. tragedy. Yeah. Yeah. Supreme yeah. tragedy. <laughs> <laughs> you do, do you know what? Just on a bit. Upon... Go ahead. I was just going to say very, very briefly, uh, and, and I, I, uh, I hope you agree, George. The <laughs> real big surprise of that series, James Belushi, man. What, he had what? me in stitches. What is going on? That yes. he was so, so funny. Oh, th- in fact, that entire dynamic, that whole sequence. I was, he I was watching it, and I was thinking, so funny. Is this going to go too far? I just, this, I mean, but then because Belushi the was just one of those guys show, that was there. You know, right. He was just there, but it, to see it, him in this, and he's been—he's—it's—it's it's brought him into a new thing. I mean, he's—he's he's magnificent in Twin Peaks. What what are their names? The uh, uh, something the brothers, brothers, isn't it? Yeah. yeah, the, yeah. Oh, they're <laughs> so good. Honestly, <laughs> love them. Love them to bits. In fact, all the new people they bring in are are, are great. I mean, because you get people like Tim Roth. No, of course, um, yeah, doing the Quentin Tarantino thing. That, that's, yeah, that's, I mean, that's part of this film. The series, Jennifer Lee. Uh, Jennifer Lee, you know, um, yeah. Jennifer Jason Lee, rather. All um, from different traditions. They're all like, it's like they're all from different realities and they're intersecting, all from different stories intersecting around Coop. Yeah. Right. <laughs> it's great. So have we sold it to you, Jack? <laughs> yeah, it's honestly. Yeah. Uh, well, I, I was, uh, I was uh, you know, prime, um, I was a prime lead, if, as they say, you know, I was already <laughs> up for buying it. So yeah, don't worry. All right. <laughs> <laughs> it is but i know what you mean george it is one of those things but i mean I, that, that's the only second time i've ever watched it through i watched it go through when it was broadcast um and um this is the second time through and it is um yeah it's one of those nice moments where you think oh i, I can't believe this was made yeah, <laughs> i can't honestly, believe I mean, I, I was, my life is intersected dubious. with this <laughs> i was very dubious as you as you often are with like old shows that are resurrected i was thinking yeah i was thinking oh can't how can this possibly capture what twin peaks was because twin peaks was so of its era it was so you know it's about me how we can cons- part of it is it's about how we consume media in the 1980s right mm-hmm. how can you do that again and they he did yeah. God damn it! He's he's done it again. He's done it for for the present day media landscape. But and it'll it's... take another fifteen years before everyone else gets to catch up. Just yeah. like Twin Peaks, basically. Yeah. <laughs> Seems so. You need that almost like quarter of a century gap, right, yeah. <laughs> for it <Yeah>. to work. <laughs> Just as everyone we're going to have to. Yeah. I think we're going to have to market this episode as a In the Mouth of Madness and <laughs> Twin Peaks The Return. Yes, I, I think honestly, probably because we, um, you know In the what? Mouth of Madness is so rhizomatic itself. It just offshoots I, into everything that, you know, you, you we could have talked about yeah, Invasion yeah. of Body Snatchers for two hours. Right, we could have talked because, about Videodrome for two hours. Yeah. Um, because it is because that's the kind of film. Media, right? um, or Lovecraft for two hours, because that yeah. is the kind of film In the Mouth of Madness is. Yeah. I mean, it is one big mouth. Um <laughs> And you're just, ah, just going down the throat into every damn place, you know, it's it's incredible. It's, isn't it just wonderful that Carpenter has this capacity, as we were talking about earlier, to take what is essentially a pulp format, you know, and to make it into something so profound. Yeah, so even much. Ferocious Doberman's made me laugh, because I thought, well, that's the omen, and he's got David it's Warner, so point. Ferocious Doberman's yeah, yeah. again. <laughs> oh, chock full of references, obviously, to, to, uh, to everything under the sun. Everything I, under the sun. I should just say, just very, very briefly, um, uh, the, the, to, to make the uh, the nerdy TV point again, it is now the third, yeah, the third um, John Carpenter film that directly influences a Doctor Who story called The Curse of Henrik. <laughs> <laughs> so you've got The Fog's Curse and its sea zombies. You've got Prince of Darkness's <laughs> Flask of Ooze. Uh-huh. And here we've got Church as a vessel for evil that acts like a disease. So, <laughs> so it's all there, John yeah. Carpenter should really sue the hell out of Ian Briggs for that. Because <laughs> <laughs> he didn't take one well, or two, he took three. He took three yeah. <laughs> Ian Briggs is just doing to Carpenter what Carpenter does to exactly. Nigel Neal. So. Exactly. To and Lovecraft and um, <laughs> Cronenberg and yeah. you, know, you name it. So it's fair game. It's very good. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, another thing I love about this film, on a purely superficial level, the makeup, the effects, and mm. some of the set pieces are beautiful. 
they're so well put together and they're, they're almost like cl- knowingly cliche horror stuff so you have the secret that sequence outside the church with the kids where they throw the ball to styles i mean that that is straight out of very early stephen king isn't it and it's almost like early stephen king cinema adaptations as opposed to the books and it's going right back again i mean what jack was saying earlier i mean that image i think was probably innovated in the in fritz lang's n yeah. with the bouncing ball yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, to describe a, a, a stolen child, a kidnapped child, a murdered child. And it's been used time Absolutely. and time and time, time and time again, again. since. It's a change. But because it's in What's this. That? Yes, yes, yes. Yes, of course. Yeah. I and guess for... the other thing is that, you know, this is a film that's very conscious about being about artists and their fan bases. And of course, uh-huh. Carpenter by this point but had, mo- you know, this is a 1994 film. He's, he's got such a cult around yeah. rather like stutter cane um, <laughs> yeah. it's quite interesting to see uh, someone who is at that point in their career do a, a a film about artists and their fan base and superficially seem quite ambivalent about it but i, uh-huh. I wonder <laughs> yeah he's not i mean he is the kind of creator who doesn't really allow himself to stoop to sentiment in this regard or to yeah. easy answers really this film, I mean, it seems to be quite simple on the surface. You know, its its responses seem to be quite simple. But when you start to analyse, when you look at context, it's actually not so much. It's just like what we were talking about earlier with regards to the apocalypse that he cre- seemingly creates here, which is, it seems to be absolutely negative on one level. But then you, it's wrinkled, you know, with all the comments that you get from Trent earlier on, with all the, the images of 1990s systemic decay and corruption. It's like... Ugh. Mm. yeah it's wrinkled yeah i think what we end up with is is um something that seems superficially like an antithesis that isn't one yeah i think it's like um you know the the end of the world that occurs in this film is not really an an, a sort of an alien imposition it's not something that comes from the outside and ruins uh, things that were going fine. Mm-hmm. It's it's just a, it's an expression of the problem in yes. the quote unquote real world, yes. isn't it? The, it yeah, just the, the apocalypse that seems to just erupt from nowhere actually comes from within this world. All they, the things we expect. Yes, it's not actually as as much as we were saying the thing earlier about Kane's fans being enlivened and uh, impassioned and mm-hmm. into it and enjoying it and stuff like that and the whole the whole sort of um i mean kane is obviously enjoying it styles is enjoying it when she is physically transformed mm-hmm. there is a there is a delight in yeah. physical transformation in this film uh-huh. um which is quite different as much as the film does refer to the thing i think quite quite definitely and um <laughs> cheekily refers to it in the scene in the cellar with the with the, the lady that runs the hotel yeah. and stuff that that mm-hmm. scene where she's turning into a gigantic tentacle monster i think uh-huh. that is carpenter winking at his own back catalog very much uh-huh. so. but the thing is the, the the um the um the things that the human body goes through in the thing there there's nothing positive about them no. whereas people in this who are physically transformed into uh, quote unquote monstrosities, there is something obviously in- enjoyable about it. There's something yeah, sublime it amusing, about it. People don't are into they, it. Uh, yeah, yeah. It's, but it's even something. so, oof, it's talking the, about that the winking, he does that um... consumes the world. It's not actually a positive thing. It is ultimately kind of empty and mindless because I think it isn't. It isn't sort of an extraneous thing. It is. An, it's an expression of that feeling of the world running down that the film yeah. expresses that's what uh, i get from it that's what i yeah. get from it this is this is not an external invasion this is not outside it's not the horror it. of the outside this is the yeah. horror of systemic collapse isn't it yes exactly yeah that's what i think yeah mm. and i think it's interesting that that's i mean that goes that takes me back to the question that i asked before do the old ones pre-exist and Kane finds a way for them to get well, through? Well, even if they do, or... even if, if even if you take that reading, I I believe even if you take that as as read, which I don't necessarily, I think it's like an Ouroboros, I don't think it's an either or thing. But taking that as read, even if that's the case, the shape they take in their natures are dictated by the world they enter into, it seems to me. Yes, and by I like Kane, your... you know. It's funny, um, Elliot said that his instinct, just on, on, on the level of vibes, was to go for the um, the option where the old ones pre-exist. Mm-hmm. And through Kane's work, they, they find a bridge or a conduit, which is very similar. Have either of you read um, the Alan Moore comic, Providence? No, no, I haven't read that no? one. 
No, it's um, it's interesting. I think it, personally, I think it's more interesting than it is entirely successful. Mm -hmm. But it's about it, it's it's an H.P. Lovecraft themed um, um, comic story, right? Uh, graphic novel, whatever you want to say. And, and what I mean, I, I, I won't spoil it because people should read it uh -huh. but it um it posits it so it's it's quite similar actually to mouth of madness in some respects to the point where i do suspect influence uh -huh. um which is which again which is fine there's no problem yeah. i'm not i'm not accusing anybody of anything no. that's fine but it's about an apocalypse which comes about um through the eruption into the quote-unquote real world of lovecraftian entities via the work of lovecraft himself right okay. um and what what the what the comic i mean it's it's alan moore so you can't make mm -hmm. definitive hard and fast statements about it and i wouldn't want to but what it seems to be saying is that these cosmic entities have found a found a way into our reality a bridge in well it's 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 alan moore so of course it doesn't take place in our reality it takes mm -hmm. place in an alternate form of history which seems yeah. to be um the, the it seems to be like um uh the development of the world that's imagined by Robert Chambers in The King in Yellow. <laughs> okay. um, but that, that, if that's his real world, then later on that real world is penetrated by Lovecraftian entities, as I uh -huh. say, via Lovecraft's work. And the idea seems to be that um, Lovecraft and the whole sort of cultural impact of Lovecraft and all the criticism of Lovecraft and uh, the entire culture of Lovecraft, as it were, um, creates a bridge whereby these things can get in. Uh -huh. And that's, it, it, as, as I say, Elliot was talking about his his uh, preferred, just on the level of vibes, his yeah. preferred reading is that they pre-exist and they get in. That's quite similar to that. And I like your, because my instinct is to go the other way. My instinct is to, mm -hmm. is to say they are Kane's creation. Right. Yeah. And that in some way um, he makes them real. And when he, I mean, I think he, he he's genuinely um, under the impression that what's happening is that he's made contact with something that pre-exists outside mm -hmm. of himself and that he's yeah. helping it to, to get in. But actually what's happening is that in some way, things that he has created yeah. are, are taking over via some sort of um, metaphysical dialectic that's happened because of the, the stunning, the, 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 essentially he started a, a vast global cultural religious movement yeah, it's, it's via fiction. Odd, he's, oddly, he's supposed to be that. It's almost supposed like to be what that happens influential Watch, and that popular. Isn't it? It, mm. Again, very similar. Yeah. But I like your Ouroboros theory as well, where mm. you, that works for me because if he invents them um, and he, this, this is something Lovecraft does. Lovecraft re creates ancient legends. He does the Gothic thing where the ancient legend or the ancient threat comes back, but the ancient threats that he has coming back, um, the repressed that he has returning are entirely invented. So what he does, yeah. he creates an entire sort of alternate mythology, mythological underpinning to all of human culture, the, what you can call the Cthulhu mythos. Yeah. And then he has that returning as if it was, as if he's writing about an, a myth, you know, it's like he's writing about like, um, um, Thor and Odin and someone comes mm -hmm. to existence, except that he, the mythology he's dealing with is one that's entirely his own creation. And yeah, it's the it's powerful, fictional, it's yeah. the oldest one. Yeah. So if, if Kane is doing something like that, then if it somehow becomes real because of that it, it's staggering sort of global belief that he creates through his mm, work, uh -huh. um, then what he's done is essentially he's created the real pre-existing outside force. Exactly then right. So there's yeah. uh, which that would certainly be birth, more uh, you know, consistent with. Actually, that interpretation would be more consistent with the the general thrust of the story, which is tapping into that whole thing of. Um, you know, you, you create a totem pole and then get down on your knees and, uh, and and worship it, and then it becomes something outside of yourself, even though yeah. you've created it. I mean, it, that that seems to be a, a a a thread in the movie anyway. Yeah, reality so, yes, is it, malleable. It does work. I think probably in terms of the vibe, the only reason that it it it, it, it I was going that way was um, I like the idea. I always like the idea that. Um, um, there's someone cleverer than us. <laughs> you will just exploit. They said, "Oh, you think you're clever, dear? Well, we've been around a lot longer." Um, but I, I think the I tend um, the to feel the same way about these sorts very... of texts as well. Mm, yeah, I, but because I, like... I tend to I tend to want to read the text as mm -hmm. about some sort of 
supernatural phenomenon that that exists yeah. outside yes. of the human yeah. mind. That's my yeah. that's my instinctive preference. So I think. But the yeah, fact yeah, that I, he, I totally get that. But he, the joy of this text is you can have your cake and eat it, can't you? Lane. You can have okay. your cake and eat yeah. it. It can be both yeah. or neither. Yeah. yeah, I mean, he's already it, done it, it to Hobbes' end. So the idea that he can do it to old ones, which are actually new ones, but exactly. for all intents and purposes, they're old ones. Yeah, he that, writes that, Trent that, that does, bits, doesn't that he? Does, he writes that Hobbes does end work. Into That's it. consistent. Definitely. That seems to just be the nature of this reality, this metaphysics, you know. Where does it begin and where does it end? Who writes whom? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, well, if if he can make his fiction reality, and he chooses, and he and he writes a fiction about a pre-existing eternal, you know, external force that he didn't invent coming into existence, right? Then that becomes reality. Doesn't that it? becomes reality <laughs> exactly. Yeah. It's the fundamental yeah. problem with the Matrix that will come later. The big, big problem with the Matrix is that it establishes absolutely there is a fictional reality and a real reality. Well. That's really problematic, isn't it? That becomes fundamentally problematic when you have entities operating within the fictional reality for whom the simulated fictional reality is the definition of what reality is. You can't tell one way or right. the other. You know? I would have to. It's been a long time for me. I would have to revisit those movies. But, uh, <laughs> it yeah, does. It, that's unfortunately, right. yeah. unfortunately, it does do that. There is like the waking reality, which is absolutely, totally, completely reality. And it is the big, big, big flaw of those films. You know? I seem to remember that you could always tell when they were in "quote unquote" real reality because everybody was wearing sort of dun-coloured right, yeah. clothes. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's right. Whereas it, yes, you know, they're, everyone's made they're glamorised and stylized and mm. um, yeah. Um, yeah, <laughs> it's it's in a way in a way this film is slightly clever on an existential level in the fact that it acknowledges at this so, point yes. reality breaks down. Notions of reality mean nothing at this point. Yeah, and if we what, what I was trying to work around to, I think, is that if we go with that, if we go with the idea that what happens is that a a pre-existing external alien force finds a bridge into the world through Sutter Kane's writing, but that happens because he writes that, mm -hmm. and his writing then becomes real. The the Ouroboros that you were talking about, um, that really. <laughs> I find that quite powerful because yeah. one of the one of the one of the um, concepts, the theoretical concepts that I think is really important for understanding the world we live in is the concept of the real abstraction. Mm -hmm. um, because I think we are we live in a world where we are dominated, where human lives are dominated by abstractions, by essentially mm -hmm. unreal things that mm -hmm. become real because we create them. Yeah. Um, our lives are dominated by things like time in the sense mm -hmm. that our lives are dominated by schedules. You know, we mm -hmm. have to clock in and clock out. We have to spend this amount of time doing this and that amount of time doing that. And my analysis, of course, would be that that comes down to the fact that we live in a capitalist economy, which is essentially a kind of domination of human time. Yeah. Um, and time is how uh, value is generated um, by capital. And so we, we live accordingly to the dictats of, of of value itself which is a socially constructed thing it's an abstraction it's it's yeah. it's it's immaterial there is no such thing as value mm -hmm. you can't hold it you can't touch it it's in every commodity but it's not a real thing um and those things dictate our entire lives they're mm -hmm. why we have to get up in the morning they're why we can't do the things we want to do we have to do things for other people instead they're you know that that is that is the entirety of human life yeah. slaved yeah. to these things that are essentially unreal, unreal abstractions, yeah but which are Nonetheless, they, they are social realities. They're yes. real in the sense that they, we have to live by them. They do dominate our time and our lives. And they're unreal in the sense that there's nothing natural or eternal about them. There's something that yeah. we make. There's something that humans do. Money. Mm -hmm. What could be yeah. more yeah. <laughs> a, a real abstraction? Money is yeah. just something we've invented. It's it's not real. It doesn't yeah. have to exist. It doesn't grow on trees. <laughs> we, we create it. And yet, it's it's absolutely crucial. We all yeah. live by... It, it's it's the ultimate imperative it dominates everything mm -hmm. you know and i think that's really the the idea of the human life dominated and tyrannized and threatened by the real abstraction mm -hmm. is kind of i get closer and closer to the idea that that's the core of the 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 expressive power of uncanny fiction yeah mm -hmm. because have the real threat 
in the frame of the story that is also an unreal thing a specter a haunting a vampire whatever you know whatever whatever it is in, in the individual case then what even at the most basic level like a ghost comes into the room and you're scared the most basic ghost story imaginable the most basic uncanny story imaginable you are telling a story about a human life dominated tyrannized by something that is real but also unreal abstract something yeah. that is spectral abstract yeah. exactly and Operates if, on the level of the I mean, if you go with that yes exactly exactly and if you go with that reading of things this is really quite a profound film for me yeah. because it's yeah it's having the entire world not just dominated by but completely destroyed by the malfunctioning of this gigantic viral um monstrous abstraction that is completely anti-human and inhuman and alien and yet is also something that humans have created so yeah. something that humans have done it's almost like a an expression of all the the sublimated self-contempt damn it's the economy the stupid the film. This is a very light film. You know, I put this on just for, just for yeah, laughs. It, it's as, odd, as, isn't it? Alien, it's it's film, fun, isn't it? It has yeah, this. That, that it, is it, exactly. Yeah. It, it, is, it, it is so rich with things that. Uh, Where's just, all this stuff incredibly likely to the point where you can just put it on for a giggle and it is very yeah. gigglesome. It is very yeah, fun. It is very it's easy. Fun, it's very no, glib, it's through. got great set pieces. Aesthetically, it's great. You know, it just it flows. Yeah, for it me, works. For me, because of maybe just because of the way I look at things, for me, there is this core of it which is really quite profound. Yeah. yeah absolutely. Definitely. Definitely. I mean, I was ha I was having a grumbly moment earlier in the week because I was watching lots of like more recent horror films that were that are doing the rounds and are, are very well regarded. People are absolutely loving these films, um, and I just it's not that they're bad per se, but because they operated on just one level, mm. I just it's couldn't really I just couldn't get anything out of them. Um, the two that really did get the ones that I I watched were Smile which everyone was, was saying is fantastic. I, I, I found that very disappointing. I found that very disappointing. I, the notion of the smile, the image of people smiling in a kind of sinister way. I thought, oh, well, what's this going to be about? Is this going to be like a commentary on like social contagion, like people being obliged to express in a way they don't feel or something like that? No, no, it's completely aesthetic. No. The only reason the smile exists is because someone in the writing room thought, oh, that's a scary image. Mm. that's it oh, that's a shame because it's a that's it's it. a very um it's a very pregnant idea when isn't you, when it? you think about i got a horror a horror film about people smiling you think yes. god there's all sorts of no, directions there is going no that. It's, do not do not expect that it there is it's nothing difficult. nothing it's in difficult it to imagine how you could write a horror story based know. on that premise and not make it meaningful actually i know, even I know. <laughs> well what they've done is all they've done is taken the the sort of classic korean japanese ghost demon story you know where it's a curse it's something that's passed on um and that's what it is that's all it is a westernized version of that and the smile is just an expression of that there's no reason for it other than oh someone thought it's a scary image that's all it is and by the end i was i was very disappointed i, I was Something heartily disappointed very similar about a fairly recent movie called men um i don't know if either of you've seen that but the, the premise it, of the, I have seen yeah it. no the, the premise sounds really interesting and i thought um there's so there's so much that could be done here with like um you know uh, gender and sexual relationships and mm -hmm. sexual dynamics and uh, patriarchy and uh, uh, male attitudes to women and also the concept seems so pregnant and you watch mm -hmm. you watch the film and it kind of does have all that but it feels like it feels very rote and trite it feels yeah. like it's sort of going through a checklist of things to intimate and you get to the end and you just think you know you i could have just read a, a two minute you know primer <laughs> on sort of aspects <laughs> of feminist theory i didn't need to watch an entire film yeah was, yeah when it I falls short like that that's not yeah that's not it good. makes me feel a bit of a curmudgeon i'll be honest it does make yeah. me feel a bit of a curmudgeon and I, I you know i don't want to um denigrate people who want to watch films like that you know at all i mean if that's that's what you want from your horror brilliant that's that's fine but it just doesn't i need if i'm finding i need something else especially after the watching this run of films and also coming off the back of twin peaks probably didn't help a great deal <laughs> you know something that's so then, big that, and I, resonant. I, I, I guess that leads us to the point of where do, where do we go from here 
Yeah. What is next? I mean, is Fire Walk with me next? I mean, ah, I mean, we did say um, Hereditary. Oh, we did say Hereditary, didn't we? We yes. did say Hereditary, did we not? And didn't we also? Oh, I am. Were we going to shoehorn Night <laughs> of the Demon in as well? Oh, really? Yeah. Wasn't that? I mm-hmm. remember that being on the short list. Yeah. I, I'm quite happy to do it if you'd like to. And, oh my god, I'm so happy with. Um, any but, of those um, really or all, all yeah of them. and yeah. all yeah I'm, I'm 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 up for doing them all and didn't we say we were going to do at the very end of this run halloween yes yes and i do yeah. believe we did yeah of course it's been a real old carpentarian it has, season hasn't this it? one I'm hasn't right, it you know oh, not yeah, it's so, not exclusively so but um he's you know so good. He's, he's just kept he coming is, back. he is so good and there's a, there's a bit of a neglected back catalogue with carpenter there were like cult films that are sort of been left by the wayside that definitely deserve dredging up yeah i mean halloween yeah. isn't one of those obviously but <laughs> well, maybe <laughs> the rest could be left alone <laughs> oh, wouldn't that be lovely <laughs> get rid of them all except halloween three that'd be yeah. great that'd be yeah. great <laughs> well, Spooktober is, um, you know, we, we're in, we're in, yeah, we've ended up with the long Spooktober. It's we're the long the Spooktober. Spooktober now. Yeah, <laughs> but, oh, as um, it should be. <laughs> yes, I'll be delighted to talk about Firewalk um, yeah. and, and really any of those others as well. Yeah. Absolutely. We so will, maybe it's something we can find. We will get back then... to Hannibal at some yes. point. Uh, oh, yes. My but, I was only thinking what? about that the yeah. other day because I picked up the discs and went, oh, yeah. I, we're on hiatus. <laughs> I, uh, yeah, I mean, I'm aching to get back to Hannibal, but what would you, what, what film would you guys like to do next? What would be the preference? I think, I think Firewalk, certainly. Yeah. Well, since, since we've gone Lynchian anyway, in this yeah. discussion. This seems I like a little I bit think, of a precursor to it, doesn't it? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. I think that would be a very, yeah. a very good next that choice. That is a bloody scary film. <laughs> I, I was going to say, I'm going to have to work up to this one, because I always, I, my impression of Firewalk with me is that it always leaves me feeling very, very unsettled. Yeah. yeah. It's so desperately moving. I it is cry incredibly every time. moving. It is yeah. incredibly moving. Genuinely, How the I hell he can it. pull off the... Because because it comes from her because it comes from her imagination when she sees a classic angel at the end <laughs> what should be absolutely claptrap like schmaltzy rub mm-hmm. it's so profoundly upsetting yeah well uh, let's not do it before we do it yeah, no, I think yeah. That's, yes indeed next, next one uh, next one yep. yeah sounds Please, good to me yeah. fire walk with me yes lovely dokey well guys before that um before we go is there anything you would like to pimp out I mean, I don't think I can now. I think we've sold out. Or oh. the last I heard, there was something like, well, there were very few tickets left. Um, <laughs> this isn't it. This is a slightly longer run from them for them as well. They've they've um, they've got this cult following, rather like John Garbenter and David Lynch. And um, <laughs> but they've they've succeeded in doing it again. So yes, it's rather exciting, I guess. Which means we won't be playing to any empty seats. <laughs> excellent, excellent <laughs> stuff. Should film this. Somebody should film this. Yeah. Do you know what it was talked about? Because someone said this, and one of the producers said, I'm not against it, but you know, one of the things I love about the theatre is the fact that it is ephemeral and it just yeah. sort of disappears into the ether. And, and you know, um, she, but at the same time, she said, um, I wouldn't stonewall the idea. Okay. Um, but it was quite interesting that one, one of the people that, that we, we had an interview for radio. Um, last week and it just so happened that the the person who is the radio presenter is is an existing fan of their work oh excellent so he literally asked to come along and interview and he was like I, I, um you know baskerville's unlike some of the other choices that have been made is not totally dependent on the season you know is there any <laughs> chance of getting out and touring it and oh. uh, it was sort of tentatively discussed um, Ooh, about a, a, a possibility of maybe doing a you know a, a, a tour of at least the the south southwest of uh, of the country maybe Ooh. which um but uh, who knows i don't know that would the, the the difficulty is i toured once with that company before and it was great fun but um we were all younger and they didn't have mm-hmm. things like children and, and stuff. Ah, now yes. the producers all have children and, <laughs> <laughs> ah, yeah. and, and other responsibilities. So I don't know, <laughs> but um, it's, uh, yeah, it's certainly certain things, but um, yeah, I might get in a, a, a sneaky, um, let's see if that, someone might uh, do a recording of it because it's now becoming such the done thing, isn't it? Really? Uh, you know? definitely. Um, the only thing would be probably difficult would be the acoustics. I mean, we have to, mm-hmm. 
because it's this gorgeous Anglican chapel. I mean, it really is a gorgeous space. Um, but we're having to do that mm. curious thing of very low volume and very maximum <sighs> articulation in order to, I mean, we can literally whisper this script, yeah. which actually helps with the atmosphere a great deal. But you you have to have so much clarity because it just gets lost. Mm -hmm. uh, so whether mistakes are wrong. be picked yeah. up by, you know, you'd need it to be well mic'd. Um, but who knows? Possible. I live I live quite near um, Salisbury Salisbury Cathedral, mm -hmm. and they 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 put plays on occasionally. And I went to see a a production of uh, King John Shakespeare's King John oh, yeah. in the yeah. cathedral, and I couldn't hear a bloody word. Oh, it was just it was so echoey. Yeah, um, in cath the the cathedral has some of the greatest acoustics for singing choral yes, work of course um in in the entire world it's famed you know salisbury uh -huh. cathedral is famed for its acoustics for yes, singers of course. Um, i'm here to tell you that for uh plays yeah no <laughs> not not being such a big space this this is manageable but it is it is rather the case that you have to kind of do that every right. you know if you if you're talking about and i've got lines about like risk you know, and, uh, and uh -huh. every end T and every end D and, you know, it's all got, to be, and, but it's also vowels because obviously uh -huh. things can be contextualized by consonants, but it's like making sure every diphthong and triphthong is there so that the audience definitely knows what you're talking about, <laughs> which is fine for Sherlock Holmes because it's Victoriana. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. it doesn't sound peculiar because the lines themselves are, you know, are in that style. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. certainly with because Holmes people itself. expect Sherlock Holmes to speak like this, don't they? Well, they, they it's As, got, um, it, it is sort of there. <laughs> slightly over enunciated. Yeah, yeah, so it, the enunciation has to be there, but technically speaking, we can't not do it yeah. so it's one of those mm. curious things you you feel slightly strange doing it and then you ask uh you know someone in the room and uh, you know like a dsm or something does that sound ridiculous they go no actually it sounds right, right. because this space won't allow for anything else but it's all co but the nice thing is it's all conversational which is very unusual you don't have to fill the space with your resonant voice mm -hmm. you can literally and particularly for the more sequences that those are have been rather fun to play when you know you're talking about the criminal seldom you can really bring it down yeah, yeah. and it and a little frisson happens you know uh, <laughs> it's, it's lovely <laughs> superb and well, jack as for myself yeah as for myself you can find me on blue sky i'm at times carcass and all the rest of the blue sky gubbins on the end of that <laughs> um i blog at eruditorn press mm -hmm. and i usa I'm incidentally Sorry, cracking new essay, incidentally. Mm -hmm. Oh, thank you. Yeah, very, I'm. Very good. I'm kind of. Um, I'm kind of writing essays again now. Uh, I've got um, one going up. Yeah, one went up last week for Halloween. First part of a, a series of essays about the ghost story. As a as go a along and read it, audience. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. All. It's Germain as well. It's Germain. Checks in the post. Checks in the post. <laughs> and um, there's another one going up tomorrow. Actually, another essay going up tomorrow um, oh, about the. 2016 horror film the boy which ah, much to my surprise i really like ah. and um so but people that go to my patreon and give me as little as one dollar a month they got access to that essay a week ago and they will get access to this recording before people are um lucky to get it on george's youtube channel they so will indeed. i do that with my patreon thing things that i do get on there early uh uh, and I, you, there, there are exclusive things on there as well. There is, um, there's loads of back episodes of a podcast that I do with Kit Power mm -hmm. and uh, Daniel Harper about the Sherlock Holmes stories, for instance. It all links up. Uh, that's that's again on a bit of a hiatus, as indeed is my main podcast. I don't speak German, but both of them are planned to come back. So um, yeah, pop over to my Patreon. Give me. Just a, a measly single dollar a month, you tight ass bastard. <laughs> and you'll get access to all these beautiful, wonderful things before everybody else. So. Brilliant. And links below, guys. As per dollar, just one dollar. One. For God's sake. <laughs> no, do it. Just give it to no. me. Link below. Easy to get. Give to. me the money. Give you us the goddamn money. Give me the <laughs> fucking money. Anything. Just go do it. Um, as for myself, guys. <laughs> 
<laughs> Fantastic. I like your approach to sort of Patreon advertising. It's justified, I, I fear. Yeah. <laughs> um, one, as myself, one guys. Dollar. <laughs> Chuck in 20 cents too much, to make it? it even better. It's too much. <laughs> it's too much money. I'm it's overcharging you, am I? Bloody <laughs> It's that double pronged assault of shame and insult. I think it works really, <laughs> yeah. really well. Uh, oh, yes, his parents are good at that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I discovered that very early on. Guilt and shame. Great ways to get people to do things for you. Very good motivators. Very good motivators. <laughs> nothing um, unhealthy about that at all. Nope. <laughs> no, no. And nothing quintessentially British. <laughs> <God, no. laughs> um, <laughs> As for myself, guys, you can find me knocking about here on Exaggerated Elegy. Uh, there's also the second YouTube channel, Our Lives in Horror, where I interview uh, lots of people who are involved in independent and small press publication horror. Um, you can, uh, if you hop over onto Arrow Films, the Arrow Films website, you will find the new Hellraiser Blu-ray Yay. set. The Quartet of Torment, I believe it's called, and uh, my colleague Kit Power and myself are on that. On the <laughs> my colleague, I love that. My colleague, yeah, my colleague, <laughs> my colleague, my colleague. Um, we're on the Hellbound disc on the uh, what's it called? It, it, Hell is what we wanted. Hell is what we it's wanted. A, basically an eighty-five minute chat about Hellbound, um, and it was fantastic. We had great fun doing that. <laughs> Uh, links to all of my published work are over at strangeplaygrounds.com and if you just go over to Amazon and type in George Daniel Lee you'll find all of my short story collections I'm also over at Blue Sky uh, I think it's exaggerated elegy for me Blue Sky dot blah blah you know the gubbins the Blue Sky gubbins that comes after um, and you can also still find me over at Twitter but I don't know for how long at this point let's see how long the platform lasts so eh? yeah I'm just uh, I I only I only promote things there now. I don't yeah. take part in the conversation on that That's particular it. Nazi chan board anymore. No, because, I am uh, really trying to sort of like shepherd everyone over to Blue Sky. That would be great. The yeah. communities that I've built over there, shepherd them over to Blue Sky because it's just a much nicer place. Certainly much nicer currently. Moment, yeah, yeah, let's hope it stays that way. Yeah, yeah let's hope so. Eh? But guys, that was fantastic. As yeah, it really was. And, and uh, uh, apologies for railroading you into, no. into Lynch, Jack. I mean, because George and I obviously yeah, are obsessed fine. with that at the moment. Well, oh, God, yeah. We've got, <laughs> you've got to do a chat about that. We must do a chat about it. Because it, it, I'm finding it's preoccupying me. It is really rattling yeah. around my head. Afraid it's, it's done I'm going to get on and watch it, and then we can do it together. So. Mm. Oh, well, I couldn't put it down, Jack. I watched it like in this long, long, like a couple of days. I watched the damn mm. thing. And it... It, it was amazing. It was amazing. I loved it. Uh, but no, I'm not going to talk yeah. about it anymore because I'll just keep <laughs> going on and on and on. Um, <laughs> but thank you guys for listening at home. Uh, until next time, bye-bye. Yes, many thanks. Bye. <laughs>